Good evening. It is 7 o'clock. We are here for a public hearing on the FY25 operating budgets and FY25 to 30 public services program and fiscal policy for Montgomery County Government, Montgomery College, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, WSSC Water, and Montgomery County Public Schools. Council committees will conduct work sessions on the budgets beginning Wednesday, April 10th, and full council work sessions will begin on Monday, May 6th. The committee schedule is available on the council's website. Each registered speaker has three minutes to speak. You will hear a tone when your time is up. We have a very large number of speakers registered to speak this evening, so we appreciate everybody abiding by their allotted time. I will note that everybody this afternoon did a great job, so thank you. Also a reminder to please res refrain from applause and approving or disapproving of individual testimony. Everyone who is registered to speak has and should be afforded the opportunity to testify before the council, so please refrain from interrupting or creating distractions. Also, per our rules for the hearing room, please do not hold up signs that will block someone's view, and please keep the aisles clear so that people can enter and exit and so our staff can do their job. With that, we are going to call on our speakers. Our first panel uh, is Grace Benube, George Hernandez, Nicholas Bassi, Anthony Sia, Debbie Brown, and Daisy Acuto. When you're ready. Council President Friedson, members of the County Council and staff, good evening. I'm Grace Manube, resident of District 6 and Vice Chair of the Montgomery County Library Board. I'm testifying this evening to request full support of the County Executive's budget request for the library system. Many library branches host bilingual programs such as Spanish and French Conversation Clubs for Adults, Virtual Spanish Conversation Club for Teens, Beginning Mandarin Chinese for Elementary Age Children, and Story Times for Infants, Toddlers, and Families. Last fiscal year, the library delivered 40 bilingual story time programs. During this fiscal year, as of today, MCPL has hosted 47 bilingual story times in Spanish and English, and 15 bilingual story times in Mandarin, Amharic, French, and Korean. 25 additional programs are currently on the calendar between now and June 30. To promote reading in the home, our youngest of readers and their caregivers must have access to books in these languages. To reflect the changing demographics in the county, the county executive's budget includes funds to revitalize the world languages materials in the library's collection. Residents with a library card have access to an impressive breadth of digital resources available 24-7. The Washington Post claims that democracy dies in darkness, but its articles are hidden behind a paywall for subscribers. With a library card, all residents have digital access to the Post and other newspapers. Did you know that the, a library card grants instant access to electronic books, audiobooks, music, and movies through the streaming service Hoopla? Residents can read popular titles and also watch the movie Oppenheimer, listen to Taylor Swift albums, and read Big Nate comics with no waiting period. Hoopla also has study aids for English proficiency and high school equivalen equivalency exams, books on how to write a resume, financial literacy, and more. The Montgomery County Public Library System is one of the world's, that's right, world's biggest users of Hoopla. The budget enhancement includes a request for additional funding to meet the county's demand for electronic resources, which provides access to library services when the buildings might be closed. Lastly, the county executive seeks funding for staff professional development and outreach strategies to continue providing residents with high quality service inside and outside of the library buildings. Justifications for these important items are included in my written testimony. On behalf of the library board, I'm urging council to approve the county's fiscal year 2025 budget request. His recommendations provide the library system with resource, the resources that it needs to continue implementation of its strategic plan and to ensure all Montgomery County residents have access to MCPL's programs and resources. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, George Hernandez. George Hernandez here. Okay, we're going to move on to Nicholas Bassey. Good evening. I'm Nicholas Bassey, Paint Branch Cluster Coordinator for the Montgomery County Council of Parent Teacher Associations, or MCCPTA. 
The Pink Branch cluster is home to approximately 7,700 students across nine vibrant schools, Burtonsville, Cloverly, Fairland, Galway, Greencastle, and William Tyler Page Elementary Schools, Benjamin Banneker and Briggs Cheney Middle Schools, and Paint Branch High School. While our schools face the staffing and other challenges faced by schools across MCPS, I'm here to focus on the unique challenges of Benjamin Banneker Middle School. The Banneker community is tired. They're tired of patching age-related CIP issues, tired of apparently unrepairable leaks in the roof, tired of quasi-functional water heaters, tired of frequent HVAC outages, tired of frequent plumbing issues included flooding sewage backups, tired of buckling basement walls, tired of feeling mostly like an afterthought or worse in a thriving county that repeatedly chooses to invest elsewhere. Despite this tiredness and disappointment, we still have hope. We have hope because of our talented students, hope because parts of East County have, that have been left to crumble are finally being seen as worth reinvestment. Hope that this group, together with MCPS, will together demonstrate that our children are just as worthy of a functional, modern school environment as those elsewhere in our county. Now, while Banneker has been extremely fortunate to have highly dedicated, talented, and dynamic staff with a can-do attitude who have become adept at dealing with the building's many shortcomings, the building's age creates myriad safety issues. Here's an abbreviated list of just some of them. The cafeteria's multi-level design is a throwback to the 70s and it's too small. It is inaccessible to students and staff with mobility issues and it repeatedly causes accidents to students and staff as they transition from one section of it to another. Banneker also has multiple interior classrooms with inadequate emergency exits, which poses all of the safety risks that you can imagine. Banneker's corridors, especially on the lower level, are too narrow for the almost 800 students who have to transit them all at the same time. Can you imagine the problems that this creates for hormonal preteens and teens? The school was built in 1974, fully half a century ago, and has not been renovated or modernized since. It was approved for a feasibility study for a major capital project in the last CIP, but we've not seen any progress toward that end. This must proceed without further delay. Please help us to remedy these stark challenges through the operating or CIP budgets. Uh, plumbing, security, space, technology, uh, other numerous challenges are created by the school's age that makes teaching and learning much more difficult than necessary. Please work with us to address the challenges by prioritizing our requests and viewing them through an equity lens. We thank you in advance for your time, attention, and action for the Benjamin Banneker Middle School community without further delay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Anthony Shia. Good evening. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And my name is Tony Shaw, and I'm the co-chair of the Friends of Potomac Community Center. And our organization works, it's a nonprofit voluntary organization that works with the staff of Montgomery County and the rec center staff to provide, to provide enhancements to one of the most utilized centers in the county. And we seek input from our local residents seniors and youngsters of their needs and desires, and we work with the Montgomery County staff to improve the Potomac Community Center service to our community. In 2023, close to 100,000 people in our neighborhood have used Potomac Community Center. There are two main reasons. One, there's a no, no membership fee. That really increased the, the participation. Second, there are great programs designed and executed by county staff and our, our friends of community center, our organization that attracted a lot of people, young and old, to participate. And we're very happy to have that results. But based on our, our observations, at that community, Potomac Community Center, as well as a few other centers, we have a few challenges we want to bring to your attention. In, in 2023, the Friends volunteers and fundraising efforts to supplement the county and the state funds, we were able to expand our fitness center and added an outdoor fitness park. Maybe one of you uh, was at the opening ceremony of the last fall. The fitness park was really well, well done and well received and increased the capacity of the line dance classes, our Tai Chi class and table tennis and pickleball programs. It's very, very popular. Thank you all. And I want to I wanna represent, I present a few challenges that we've seen observed from the um, Potomac Community Center since 2023. And like the council member to take into consideration ways to alleviate those problems and during your budget deliberation to, to make Potomac Community Center and other centers a better place for our citizens. And Com Potomac Community Center has over 30 years 
of history and it's one of the oldest and the smallest rec center in the county and yet it, its utilization rate is very high the burden on the facility is obvious we can see it every day so the, the facility maintenance and refreshment and replacement needs are critical to not only the Potomac Community Center but also to many of the county other county rex facilities for example these resources will allow the facilities to be painted to replace old carpet and fitness another challenge is the need for permanent mostly permanent staff members at Potomac Community Center other rec facilities I've watched staff turn over many times and it's and it's really hurting the delivery of services to our residents so I would like to ask the county to consider permanent staff increased member to manage the facility and its programs thank you thank you for your testimony our next speaker is Debbie Brown my name is Debbie Brown and I live in Rockville Maryland I am speaking on behalf of the Montgomery County Public Libraries Accessibility Advisory Committee, of which I am secretary. The Library Accessibility Advisory Committee advises the MCPL director and library board members on providing services to people with disabilities. We would like to thank the council for proclamations of White Cane Awareness Day and Braille Literacy Month. We would also like to thank Kristen Mink for spending time with our committee and attending the Louis Braille birthday party. We support the letter submitted by the library board and the Friends of Libraries Montgomery County. We would like to see the library fully funded and fully staffed because any time a service is cut or compromised, library users pay the price. For example, many websites and computer applications are inaccessible to people with disabilities including those provided by the montgomery county government staff members respond to walk-in requests for assistance in acquiring information and to phone requests inaccessible websites cause the library to respond to more phone requests library staff members have to deal with all of society's problems and in order to do that they need training as a person with a disability, I know that the library staff members receive some very good disability-related training. Fully funded staffing assures that library staff members have the time to implement what they learn. The county has been promoting early literacy programs to support the goal of kindergarten readiness for Montgomery County residents. These programs are valueless if there is not appropriate funding to purchase accessible early literacy materials for all children, including those with disabilities. We would like to commend the library for providing sensory story times and encourage this program to be continued. We are happy to see the library acquiring more materials in languages other than English, but these materials are valueless to those with disabilities who need this service if materials are not provided in formats they can use, such as Braille and large print. Our libraries are a valuable community resource, and people with disabilities are a growing part of that community. A fully funded budget assures that all county residents benefit from library services. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your testimony. I did want to acknowledge that Councilmember Mink is attending virtually. Our last speaker on this panel is Daisy Akudo. Good evening, Council Members. My name is Daisy Akudo, and I live in Gettysburg, Maryland. I'm here to advocate for better access to breast cancer screening for uninsured um, women in the county. Currently, it takes an average of two months to get an appointment for mammogram. And this is too long because um, early detection of breast cancer saves lives. I found out about this problem at Shady Grove Hospital where I, as a cosmetologist, I volunteer and teach patients how to deal with hair loss resulting from um, cancer treatment. So these patients, they tell me about their frustration in getting appointments for mammogram. And some of them are even referred to Frederick County. They call the Department of Health Services and they are referred to PCC, the Primary Care Coalition, 
and then they call PCC and they are directed to Frederick County and then it's, that's when the eligibility process starts. So and um, as the second most diagnosed cancer for women in the United States, when detected early, uh, breast cancer has the um, greatest chance of being treated. So given the impact of breast cancer on families, I would recommend that we have like um, a one-stop office or a site within the county where these patients can come in person or come virtually to get access to these services. Thank you for your attention and service. Thank you for your testimony. Our next panel, Claire Song. Sadatu Clark, Barbara Tomar, Emily Beckman, Maria Enriquez, and Victoria Thomas. Claire Song, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Hello, members of the County Council. My name is Claire Song, and I'm currently a sophomore attending Clarksburg High School. I'm here to tell you that we need to add money to the MCPS's proposed budget in order to maintain funding for restorative justice coaches. I have seen how important it is in schools. It may be a difficult year, it may be a difficult budget year for the county, but in the end, we all want better, healthier students. And we can have it today if you vote for this proposal. Two years ago, when I was in eighth grade, I was in my global humanities class. There were many in-class assignments and tests. However, there was one specifically where I was sitting next to my friend, and we started playing around and goofing off. This resulted in the teacher suspecting us for cheating and gave us both a zero on the assignment, with no given chance to explain what really happened. How is this fair? Would he have believed us if we were given a chance to say what really happened? Defeated and hopeless, we had to take a zero despite the fact that we did not cheat. I know some of my friends who have had similar experiences, and I know we all know other students have as well, all of which face consequences that frankly were not fair. Restorative justice is a mindset and philosophy towards positive and inclusive school culture and focus on relationship building. If the teacher used a restorative justice approach, he could have given a warning first, or again, asked us why we were behaving that way. Restorative justice coaches are necessary because they help implement these practices with teachers, students, and administration at the school level. This dedicated professional has the capacity to rethink and implement new systems in our school. With their help, I think we would have been able to find some solutions both my friend and I could have stronger say in our actions. You, as members of the council, face a choice today. We can leave things the way they are or invest in a better way. I hope today you take the time to think through all the students who could benefit from a different approach, led by a caring professional, as well as rethink our systems that we know aren't exactly right. Please add money to the MCPS's proposed budget so that we can keep the same level of funding of our restorative justice coaches. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Sadatu Clark. You just need to hit your button there on the right. Yep, thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Sadatu Clark, and I'm from Harvest Intercontinental Church in Olney, Maryland, under Bishop Darlington Johnson. We are a member of AIM. I'm here tonight to urge you to create more pre-K seats in Montgomery County. You see, I raised my children in Montgomery County from Tacoma Park Elementary to Sherwood High in Olney. I had to move many times to find all day kindergarten. I used to work downtown Washington, D.C. with Fannie Mae on Wisconsin Avenue, and I live in Tacoma Park. I took many buses and trains, 14 stops to get there, back and forth. I moved 
just to find all the daycare. It was a struggle. That was two decades ago. Here we are today, 2024. I work with children's ministry at my church with three and four year olds. And I deal with parents who are going through the same struggle I went through. And I find that very difficult to understand. I don't know how to deal with that. On March 17, when we had the action for pre-K, some of you were there and you heard from parents about the same need. Parents of all socioeconomic levels, they face the same difficulties I faced over two decades ago. Low income and middle, middle income parents. And this is everyone's problem. But this is our future, Montgomery County. We can do something about it. Today, today we experience a total eclipse. It was a wonder. Did anyone do anything about it? You stood and you watch. That's all we all could do. But now, under your administration, there are things that you can do now. Your name will be attached. That will be your legacy. That's your future. So I'm here in front of you, council members, to ask you to invest in pre-K expansion in our county. There are three things we are requesting. In six months, we will need a clear five-year timeline for creating new pre-K seats beyond the requirements of the blueprint with the coordination of MCPS and all other stakeholders involved in this expansion. We really have to focus on that. Then we need a central coordinator who can work with our congregations who are interested in leasing space to support pre-K expansion. Additionally, we need technical bilingual assistance for child care providers. There are many of them. They are our small business owners and they want to access grants from the Department of Education. I want to thank you for listening. God bless you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Barbara Tomar. Uh, good evening, council members. I'm Barbara Tomar. I'm a member of Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist and a volunteer with AIM. Um, I wanted to talk tonight for a few minutes about dental care access. Um, AIM's been working on this issue for over two years and we listen to more than 1,500 folks around the county that are part of the AIM family and we heard that access to dental care for underinsured and uninsured folks in this county, there's just a total dearth of it. And for the people who actually can get care or get access to some kind of care, it's, it's prohibitively expensive. So in this past, uh, as, as many of you know who were at our big action that we had in, uh, in December of last year, we asked to, you to provide funds for dental care and you agreed. In the past year's fiscal budget, you did make some key investments in dental care, which will help support both um, the county dental clinics and our safety net clinics. We also understand that because of a series of procurement delays, the county HHS um, agency has not been able to secure the mobile health and dental van and get it up and running yet, but they hope to this summer. Um, but meanwhile, while waiting for the procurement process, we worked together with the uh, local primary care coalition and the Amer American Diversity Group, which is a group of dentists that do a lot of pro bono work in different parts of the county. And we were able to secure um, foundation funds to make sure that the mob a mobile dental clinic visited the Hewitt Avenue neighborhood three times between late December and, <laughs> and March. So. We, we, we did have some success there through the foundation. It was sort of like a start, startup money. This pilot project was successfully implemented and 35 people were served. Many people signed up and to the surprise of the uh, providers, everyone showed up. So there was a bit of a demand that outstripped the supply of time because a lot of people that came didn't need a cleaning and a uh, screening. They needed some fairly sophisticated clinical um, diagnostic and clinical work. So at this point, um, we are asking you to, to provide adequate funding for dental care 
so that the county mobile dental clinic can continue to, to work in, or can begin to work on the community and try to address some of these um, unmet needs. Um, and we further ask that the, the dental van build on lessons from this early pilot to both connect the uninsured and the underinsured with really a bricks and mortar <coughs> approach so that they have some place to go other than waiting for the van to come around in order to have the more complex care that some of them actually need. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily Beckman. President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. My name is Emily Beckman, and I'm honored to testify on behalf of the Walter Johnson Cluster of PTAs. First, let me thank President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and Council Member Mink for communicating your support for Woodward's needs to the Board of Education and to your council colleagues. We are grateful. Nine of you represent districts where all or part of the district will be impacted by Woodward's reopening. We need all of you to help. The Walter Johnson Cluster is outraged by MCPS's proposal to open Woodward High School without the full amenities available at every other Montgomery County High School, specifically without an auditorium. Phased construction is far more expensive than building a school in a single phase. The $20 million currently required to build an auditorium at Woodward in Phase 2 will undoubtedly increase if it is relegated to a third phase of construction. We have no confidence in MCPS assurances that this proposed Phase 3 will ever happen. They have provided no timeline nor funding in the proposed CIP. Assurances without funding are meaningless. An auditorium is a necessary facility for an MCPS high school. Fall plays, spring musicals, choral, orchestra, and band concerts are essential offerings of every single Montgomery County high school. These programs provide community and connection. At a time when attendance and student mental health are top concerns, we should not be cutting back on programs and spaces that make kids want to go to school, that make them feel accepted and celebrated. High school auditoriums, of course, are not only used for artistic productions. They have a wide range of uses further detailed in our written testimony. The county is about to embark on a boundary study to determine which students will be reassigned to Woodward High School. This boundary study will be of a scale never before attempted by MCPS. It will include communities from eight existing high schools comprising 36% of all MCPS students. It is both unwise and counterproductive to enter into this boundary study allocating students to eight schools that have auditoriums and one that does not. There were good reasons for splitting the construction of Woodward High School into two phases despite the inevitable added costs of phased construction. There are not good reasons to further splinter the Woodward project into an additional phase three. If you vote to move required facilities at Woodward to a new phase three, you do so knowing that you are voting to open Woodward High School without an auditorium. Please do not do so. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker, Maria Enriquez, and I believe we have translation. Thank you. Buenas noches, señores del consejo. Mi nombre es María Enríquez. Soy residente del condado de Montgomery. Estoy aquí ante ustedes el consejo del consejo para abordar un tema preocupante relacionado con el medio ambiente y la salud. Nuestros planetas están sufriendo en una crisis climática y necesitamos leyes más estrictas para abordar la principal causa de crisis en, la, en el quema de combustibles fósiles en el, en el sector de transportes, industrias como fábricas y la gener generación de energía. Estamos en, en la emisión de carbono pon en peligro el clima y la salud a nuestra familia. La contaminación del aire representa un grave riesgo para la salud pública. Aumenta el riesgo de infecciones respiratorias como el asma, enfermedades cardíacas, acide, um, cerebrales, musculares, cáncer pulmonar. Según la Organización Mundial de la Salud, es muy pequeño el hasta el 2.5 micros de diámetro 
dos punto, um, además de la contaminación, es responsable de casi 6 millones de partos prematuros que casi 3 millones de bebés no nacen. Bajo peso, según la misma organización, debido a las pequeñas tamaños, están partículas pueden ingresar al sistema circulatorio de a través del pulmón alternado a función de la placenta y el cordón umbilical, lo que conduce a difícil oxígeno al embrión, retrasando el desarrollo, así como partos prematuros. El ozono, el dióxido de nitrógeno y el, el azufre son algunos de los principales contaminantes del aire que se enfrentan en la salud de las embarazadas y sus bebés. Estos componentes se, com se combinan con partículas finas de en el aire, presentando un riesgo significativo para la salud del feto. Es fundamental que el Consejo tome medidas decisivas y contesta para abordar estos problemas. Urge reducir la contaminación del aire garantizado del ambiente saludable para todos nosotros, nuestra comunidad. Listos de consejo es urgencia. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Maria Enriquez, and I am a resident of Montgomery County. I am here before the council to address concerning a concerning issue related to the environment and our health. Our planet is undergoing a climate crisis, and we need stricter laws to address the main cause of this crisis, the burning of fossil fuels in the transportation sector and industry, such as factories and energy generation. These carbon emissions endanger the climate and the health of our families. Air pollution poses a serious risk to public health, increasing the risk of respiratory infections, asthma, heart diseases, strokes, and lung cancer. According to the World Health Organization, this exposure causes around 4.2 million premature deaths worldwide due to exposure to very small pollution particles up to 2.5 micrometers in diameter. Additionally, pollution is responsible for nearly 6 million premature births and nearly 6 million babies being born with low birth weight, according to the same organization. Due to their small size, these particles can enter the circulatory system through the lungs, disrupting placental and umbilical core function, leading to oxygen deficiency in the fetus and delayed development, as well as premature birth. Ozone, nitro nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide are some of the main air pollutants that affect the health of pre pregnant women and their babies. These components combined with fine particles in the air posing a significant risk to fetal health. It is essential for the Council to take decisive and concrete actions to address this urgent problem and reduce air pollution, ensuring a healthy environment for all of us in our community. I ask the Council to act urgently on climate protection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our last speaker on this panel, Victoria Thomas. Good evening. My name is Victoria Thomas, and I want to thank the Council again for this opportunity to speak in favor of a county-supported, no-cost spay-neuter clinic for underserved county residents, including community cat caregivers. This is mandated in the Chapter 5 Code and was recommended in the Maddie's Pet Challenge Council, which you all received. I'm here representing the Montgomery County Community Cat Coalition, MCC3, a nonprofit all volunteer animal welfare organization formed in 2016. We promote the welfare of community cats through trap neuter return by supporting community cat caregivers with spay neuter, cat food, cat shelters, and vet care. The Montgomery County Animal Services and Adoption Center, the county shelter, was a key player in the formation of MCC3, and since then the county refers virtually all healthy outdoor cats to us. Our volunteers get daily calls about both community and friendly cats and kittens. 
For example, MCC3 trapped and vetted a majority of the Himalayan cats were recently abandoned in Sligo Creek Park. However, without a low-cost spay-neuter <coughs> clinic in our county, we must compete with other animal welfare organizations and underserved residents in other counties for scarce low-cost spay-neuter slots. There was a waiting list of weeks, if not months, and by that time the cats we are asked to TNR are gone or have given birth to new community cats. We also interact regularly with indoor-outdoor cats of underserved residents who also have no access to low-cost spay-neuter, so their cats continue to breed and add to the community cat population, and many end up in our shelter. The Maddie's Fund Consult suggests that at least five subsidized surgeries for pets belonging to socioeconomically challenges, challenged individuals per 1,000 constituents will reduce shelter intake. For our county, that means about 5,000 surgeries per year. And for a subsidized program to help pet owners in need, the cost must be no higher than $20 per spay neuter. Thus, MCC3 has been a key partner in McSNP, a coalition of county animal welfare organizations which has a proposal to run a no-charge spay-neuter clinic for underserved residents, including commu community cat caregivers, leveraging a fully equipped mobile spay-neuter clinic for a dollar a month. We asked the county for additional funding in the OAS budget for staff and supplies so that the clinic can be fully operational, providing up to 4,000 surgeries per year. We look forward to working with the new OAS director, Carolyn Harefield, who I met with this morning. In our progressive county, no-cost spay-neuter is not only a prudent investment since it will reduce cost to the county by reducing the number of animals entering the shelter, it is also ethically the right thing to do so that all of our county residents have the same access to vet care. Thank you for your time, and if anybody needs a kitten, please let me know. <laughs> Noted, and thank you. Our next panel, Ellie Lichtash, Elena Bernditas Argueta, Marina Azizi, Anreo St. Gerard, Jamila Ba, and Ramato Bakari. Just ask those who are leaving the room to please try to be as quiet as you can. Ellie, when you're ready, you have three minutes. My name is Ellie Liktash, and I'm here with my friends from AIM to ask the county to support the pre-K grants that are available by the MSDE and help us get more providers to provide those grants to our citizens. I am a provider. I'm head of a, of a school. I'm an attorney in my profession, and I want to tell you how hard it is to reach out into the pre-K grants, and I want to ask for your help. One thing that is very difficult is the amount that are loaded per child under the grant. $13,000 does not cover our cost. At minimum, it is twenty-two dollars to $23,000 when you add the special programs for IEPs, for special languages, and so forth. This county has provided Equicare this year but they stopped it at the age of three. If we allow Equicare to go to four and f three and four, you are supporting providers and you encourage providers to participate in the pre-K grant so that they can actually cover their cost. Only seven schools in Montgomery County out of hundreds are part of the pre-K program. Why only seven? Let's enlarge that. How can we do that? Support financially? <coughs> help the providers to write the grants. This year, some nonprofit organization was able to help some providers because the, the, the private providers do not speak the same language as the public school. We use different terminology. So we might actually provide whatever they're asking for, but we can't put it on a paper because we don't know what kind of lingo they're looking for. So helping in writing the grants by Montgomery County can help us reach more and access that money. And now there are two other elements that are very difficult, and I'm going to ask the county to help as an agency with MSDE. MSDE criteria to apply for the grant is very, very uh, 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 tremendously harsh. They put the credentialing as part of what we need to apply for. Credentialing is a requirement of teachers to reach a certain level. There are no teachers available in the workforce that want to work with early childhood. 
We can't find early childhood graduates who want to do the work. So we take other people with a BA. And so I have a JD, CPAs, Masters in History, Masters in Design, MBAs who work with early childhood program. We train them. By the time we train them with 150 hours, they're done. They're ready. They're teachers. But credentialing is asking another element. They want them to go back to college and do other college courses. This is harsh on a mother with three kids who's working for $60,000 a year. She has an MBA. She can go into the business world and make 160. Why would she go into college? So credentialing actually put a ceiling on top of their heads they don't want. So instead of bringing other degrees and degree holders into the workforce of early childhood, they're actually channeling them out. They're not encouraging our workers to stay in. They're staying out. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Elena Brandidas Argueta. Buenas noches, Presidente Freison y miembros del Consejo del Condado. Mi nombre es Elena Argueta y vivo en Silver Spring, especialmente en el Condado. Soy, ahora quiero hablar sobre la importancia del pre k y la necesidad que tiene nuestra comunidad de que se aseguren mejores canales de comunicación y cooperación entre las entidades que están trabajando en la expansión, en la expansión del pre k en nuestro condado. Vengo de El Salvador, un país que a pesar de tener una, una historia política este, compleja, garantiza el pre k universal desde los tres años. Fui profesora de pre k durante 20 años en mi país y participé en el programa de investigación que dieron como resultado el marco teórico que hoy se maneja a nivel nacional. Entiendo la importancia que tiene la educación en la primera infancia. Y sé que muchos de ustedes también lo valoran. Junto con mi esposo, nos venimos obligados a salir de nuestro país por la violencia. Por la violencia. Y al llegar acá, en el 2019, una de mis prioridades era continuar trabajando como maestra. Sin embargo, la información para obtener la licencia es confusa y el proceso es muy lento. Sé que hay una escasez de maestros, pero ¿cómo pu pueden personas como yo, con 20 años de experiencia y estudios universitarios, calificar para, un, para trabajo como profesora aquí en el condado con muchas barreras que se ponen en el proceso? Creo firmemente que este debería ser un punto prioritario en su agenda de trabajo. Además, se ha observado que muchas familias en nuestro condado desconocen los programas del pre k disponibles. La comunicación en este sentido está fallando, simplemente mostrar imágenes publicitarias no funciona, no es suficiente. Agradezco a los concejales Albornoz, Glass, Kat, Luisky, Witky, eh, Mink, Mink, Sales, por asistir a nuestros foros y sesiones de escucha sobre las barreras claves que nos impiden expandir el pre k Pero también invito al resto a ustedes a que se comprometan con las comunidades del condado. Y finalizo con una pregunta. ¿Podrán garantizar que INCPS esté creando proactivamente un plan de expansión del pre k proyectando año tras año con metas claras y compartiéndolo con la Alianza de Oportunidades para Niños y Niñas, ya que ellos son el presente y serán el futuro de este país. Gracias. Good evening, President Fritzen and members of the County Council. My name is Elena Brindidis Argueta and I live in Silver Spring. Today I want to talk about the importance of pre-K and the need for our communities to ensure better communication and cooperation among the entities working on expanding pre-K in our county. I come from El Salvador, a, a country that despite its complex political history, guarantees universal pre-K education from the age of three. 
I served as a pre-K teacher for 20 years in El Salvador and participated in research programs that resulted in uh, the theoretical uh, use nationwide. I understand the significance of early childhood education and I know many of you value it as well. Along with my husband, we were forced to leave our country due to violence and upon arriving here in 2019, one of our priorities was to continue working as teachers. However, the information to obtain the license is confusing and the process is slow. I know there is a shortage of teachers, but how can people like me with 20 years of experience, a college degree, can qualify to work as a teacher in this county with so many barriers in the process? I firmly believe this should be a priority on your agenda. Further, uh, furthermore, I have observed that many families in our county are unaware of the available pre-K programs. Communication in this regard is lacking. Simply cho showcasing advertising images is not enough. I want to thank Council Members Albornoz, Glass, Katz, Lukey, Mink, and Sales for attending, attending our forums and listening sessions regarding the key barriers preventing us from expanding pre-K. But I also invite the rest of you to engage with the county's communities. And I conclude with a question. Can you ensure that MCPS is proactively creating a pre-K expansion plan, projecting year by year with clear goals in sharing it with the Children's Opportunity Alliance as they are the present and the future? Thank you very much. Thank you, muchas gracias. Our next speaker, Marina Azizi. My name is Marina Hazizi, and I live at the Hinkleff Apartments in Silver Spring. Thank you, Council Member Albornoz and Council Member Mink, for coming to visit our school on market day and listen to families uh, directly. Today, I will be speaking about the need for uh, linkage to, um, uh, to learning programs at the Burnt Mills Elementary School. In my country, I was trained. I was trained as a medical doctor, so I understand that in order for child to be able to learn in school, she will need some basic support around food, shelter, a sense for, of uh, safety and security. Bart Mills is a very diverse community and um, has become even more diverse over the past few years, with more families arriving from it, Ethiopia, uh, Afghanistan, and West Africa. Many of the families are refugees. What we have understood is that resettlement agents uh, have not been able to adequately support refugee families. Attention should be given to newly arrived immigrants as they have left their homeland in difficult conditions. They continue to, fa to face past, present, and future challenges that lead to stress and can be psychologically damaged. Therefore, necessary support should be provided to reduce stress and enhance their mental well-being. The main thing is to make them busy through con conducting uh, vocational tra training such as cooking classes, saving classes, etc. Additionally, Additionally, support is very important for people who have work skills but are not fluent in English and do not know American laws. Families who have children under 40 years old and want to work, they need child care center. Now I mentioned earlier that I lived at the enclave. I'm sure that by now you all know about the difference between what is written at the street sign lecture and the uh, uh, reality of the conditions in the apartment buildings. For example, sometimes no water, no gas, no working elevator, <coughs> iron, and it has more mice. It's part of way we hope for something better when our students attend school. There are many wonderful things about Bournemouth Elementary School, such as supporting refugee families through food packets and English classes for women. While the teachers of Burnt Mills have welcomed us as best they can, they need county support. 
We believe that the linkage uh, to learning program with a uh, therapist and the uh, case worker could really help our students and the community. Council members, in this year's budget, we uh, will, will you please include funding for a linkage, linkage to learning program at Bond Mill? Thank Th you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Henriot St. Gerard. Thank you. Uh, so many familiar faces here. Um, my name is Andrea St. Gerard. I am a Sherwood Cluster Coordinator and Area Vice President for the Northeast Consortium. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight on the recommended budget. While this year's uh, budget for MCPS includes significant investments important to my cluster, particularly in children's mental health through dedicated funds for social worker and psychologist positions, I'm disappointed by the reduction of approximately 430,000 for contractual services, HVAC technician, and other HVAC maintenance services. Though seemingly insignificant, given the persistent HVAC issues in our county schools, every dollar is crucial for ensuring an efficient system for repairs and replacements. It is imperative that we prioritize, invest, and streamline approaches to manage HVAC concerns, ensuring a safe learning environment for our students. More importantly than asking you this evening to be mindful to not significantly reduce this year's budget, is my request to hold MCPS accountable for spending their money correctly and not putting it to waste. For too long, I have come before this council and the Board of Education seeking results on issues around equity, school safety, and HVAC matters. The ongoing lack of action, particularly regarding seemingly mundane issues such as HVAC, underscores this systematic failure. While MCPS is not in dire straits, the trajectory towards relying on press releases and strongly worded statements as solutions is concerning. It is imperative that the council comprehends the gravity of the situation. Let us collectively prioritize the needs of our students and commit to delivering the highest quality education in Montgomery County. This entails addressing instances of unreported and ignored misconduct with the gravity they warrant and implementing processes and procedures to ensure our financial investments in schools are utilized effectively. I thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Jamila Ba. Good evening, Council President Fritzson and member of the Montgomery County Council. My name is Jamila Ba, and I live in Montgomery, County, uh, Montgomery Village. My son attended South Lake Elementary School, and he's currently at Nilesville Middle School. I also support Safe Places, the Turner Association at Sidon Mill Apartment. I want to thank Council Kat for your continued support of the resident of Sidomir. Today, I'm here to talk about the need for a recreation center and youth activity for the young people who live in Montgomery Village. I also want to thank Council Sales and Lutke for all your support in the effort. There has been a serious increase in crime and violence, some of which is related to gangs. The closure of Lake Forest Mall, which is technically in the in city of Gettysburg, but just across the street of Sidomir apartment, which is in Montgomery Village, has led to worsening crime-related problems. Let me be explicit. Gunshot during daytime, hours, drug use, sale of drugs. During daytime at three, some, someone was stabbed at the CVS on, in Montgomery Village. We are really worried about our safety and our children's safety. Our tenant association have been working with the property manager, the property owner, and the police department, as well as council sales and council Lutke office to address the crime. We have also worked with Joe Hooks, at the 480 Club to bring soccer program to engage our youth people in organized after school program. These are important steps, but we need your support to prevent crime and provide alternative to our young people. 
but we need to do more. I have two asks. First, Council Member, I urge you to support the first step toward to identifying a space for recreation activity in Montgomery Village. With Council Member Lutke and Cell support, the County Executive has recommended, has recommended adding 50000 to begin studying potential space for Montgomery Village slash Gettysburg Recreation Center. Please support this item in this year's budget. Second, I urge you to please support activities that engage out of school young people productively to jobs. We have we have to give young people an alternative to be able to walk away from illegal activities. With those investments, Montgomery Village can be, again, a great place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker on this panel, Ramatu Bakari. Good evening, Council President Fresson and members of our county council. My name is Rama Tubakori. I'm a mother of six children, ages from 2 to 21. My children are currently enrolled in Captain James Daly Elementary, Nearsville Middle School, Watkins Mill High School, and Montgomery College. Tonight, I'm here to talk about the need of a portable pre-K for our three and four years old children in Montgomery County. Pre-K has supported my children's education and development in a very positive way. I will try not to brag too much, brag too much, but I can tell you that my children have been honorable students since kindergarten and taken advanced level classes because of pre-K education. On top of that, pre-K education will also give many parents opportunity to go to work or to school, and it will also make an easy transition for the teachers. I want universal pre-K in Montgomery County because what we currently have is very complicated. Where different um, part of a government offices are not communicating with each other and leaving parents to figure things out. Let me give you an example so you can understand it better. I am so grateful for the Child Care Subsidy Program and Working Parent Assistance Program. This program I help with me and my two youngest children, Fatima, who's three, and Amir, who's two years old. However, even with this help, I still have to come up with nearly $1,000 a month to cover the daycare tuition. Please also understand to be able to secure child care subsidies, it has not been an easy process. My first application was denied almost three times because I was told I, was not, um, I did not submit enough um, document a letter from my employer stating my salary was not clear. Then I was also told that the front of my pay stop was too small to be read, and um, that case was denied. It's a headache and it's very stressful to go through this unbelievable requirement and process. Luckily for someone like me who speak English and is able to use computer, um, you know, so it's very stressful to go through this. And um, imagine what it can be for those who cannot speak English, who doesn't even know how to use a computer. I can't count the amount of times I had to advocate for other parents who cannot communicate in English related to the application process. It's also not being an easy to be a middle class parent in Montgomery County um, to, related to subsidy care um, programs. I believe a universal pre-K program will make it easy for many parents. The first step is getting us universal pre-K is to come up with collective vision, collective plan and expansion. Council member, thank you for coming out to our universal pre-K meeting on March 17. Can you please ensure that MCPS Health and Human Service um, and Children Opportunity Alliance work together to come up with an expansion uh, with a target in the next six months? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Our next panel is Anna Argueta, Michael Britnall, Chelsea Zhu, Lucia Vasquez, Supreya Mordecai, and Heidi Garcia. I 
believe Anna has translation services when you both are ready. You have three minutes. Ah, muy buenas noches, señor presidente y demás uh, concejales del condado de Montgomery. Mi nombre es Anargueta y resido en Silver Spring, en los apartamentos de Northwest Park. Muchos de ustedes ya me conocen y eso es positivo. Estoy aquí nuevamente porque soy parte de un proceso de liderazgo que se ha cultivado durante años en nuestra comunidad. Quiero compartir un poco sobre mi historia. Un día, vecinos voluntarios de la Iglesia San Camilo y organizadores de acción en Montgomery tocaron a mi puerta para hablar sobre las condiciones del barrio. La persistencia y amabilidad me motivaron a involucrarme. Gracias al apoyo de muchas personas, tuve la valentía de hablar en nombre de mi comunidad frente a los propietarios de Northwest Park, exigiendo mejores condiciones de vida para nuestras familias. Aunque temblaba, mi, aunque temblaba de, de miedo, ese día logramos negociar mejoras para nuestras viviendas. Esto ocurrió hace más de siete años. Yo me convertí en líder después de esa llamada de mis vecinos. Me involucré como voluntaria en la escuela de mis hijos. Hoy en día he asumido nuevos retos. En febrero fui elegida presidenta del PTA de la escuela Joan Lelec y también continúo trabajando con vecinos para hacer de nuestro barrio un lugar más seguro y agradable. La escuela primaria Joan Lelec, a la que asiste mi hijo menor, es una escuela comunitaria y también forma parte del título 1 por lo que contamos con el programa IBB. Gran parte de mi formación como líder ha venido de los fondos de ese programa que beneficia a muchas familias del barrio y de la escuela. El equipo de acción en Montgomery nos ha disciplinado y ha apoyado para trabajar en pro de nuestra comunidad. Estos próximos meses tenemos grandes retos. Nuestra escuela se va a remodelar y vamos a tener que organizar los buses escolares para llevar a nuestros hijos a los, al otro edificio. Estamos construyendo un equipo de papás y mamás que quieran unirse a, a nosotros para trabajar en pro de nuestros niños. Por eso les pido que continúen apoyando el programa de IBB y que mejoren la supervisión del programa. Ay, ay, ay. <ríe> Incluyendo que supervisen el programa e incluyendo más fondos para organizaciones de padres en los presupuestos del condado. Estos programas realmente funcionan. Yo soy la prueba viviente de ello. Gracias por su atención y por trabajar juntos para nuestro condado. Gracias. Good evening, uh, President Fritzen and fellow council members of Montgomery County. My name is Ana Argueta and I reside in Silver Spring specifically in the Northwest Park Apartments. Many of you already know me, and that's a positive thing. I am here once again because I am part of a leadership process that has been cultivated over the years in our community. I'd like to share a little bit about my story. One day, neighbors, volunteers from St. Camillus Church, and organizers from AIM knocked on my door to discuss the neighborhood's conditions. Their persistence and kindness motivated me to get involved. Thanks to the support of my people, I have the courage to speak on behalf of my community. I had the courage to speak on behalf of my community to the owners of Northwest Park, demanding better living conditions for our families. Although I was trembling with fear, that day we managed to negotiate improvements for our homes. This happened over seven years ago and that's how I became a community leader. In my case, after that call from my neighbors, I got involved as a volunteer at my children's school. Nowadays, despite my shyness, I have taken on significant challenges. In February, I was elected president of the PTA at Joanne Lelec School, and I also continue working with my neighbors to make our neighborhood a safer and more pleasant place. Joan Lelec Elementary School, where my youngest uh, son attends, is a community school and also part of a Title I, so we have that EBBE program. Much of my leadership training has come from the funds of this program, which benefits many families in the neighborhood 
in the school. The Action in Montgomery team has trained and supported us to work for our communities. In the coming months, we have significant challenges. Our school will undergo remodeling, and we will need to organize the school buses that will take our, our children to the building. We are building a team of parents who want to join us to work for our children. Therefore, I ask that you continue to support the EBBE program and include more funding for the parent organization in the budget that has already been included in the county's executive budget. These programs really work, and I am a living proof of this. Thank you for your attention and for working together to improve our, com our county. Thank you. Our next speaker, Michael Britnell. Thank, uh, thank you, President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, members. Um, good evening. I am Michael Brentnell. I'm chair of the Board of Trustees at Montgomery College. And on behalf of the faculty, the staff, students, and I think you'll hear from some, some of them tonight, uh, Dr. Williams and uh, my colleagues on the board, thank you very much for your support of Montgomery College. For FY25, the board has adopted a fiscally conservative operating budget that does not request additional funds from the county. It's a budget that maintains affordability for students, which is essential for their success. Uh, it holds tuition flat again for the third time in, uh, in four years. Uh, and I should say, by the way, that enrollment is up. We're seeing more students in the fall semester, more in the spring semester, and they're taking uh, more, more credit hours. Uh, with your support, the budget supports fair and reasonable wage increases for faculty and staff, which are a dedicated and, and terrific group. Um, and the appropriation supports the East County uh, Education Center operations, which are in fact operating. I can please to tell you that the center is, uh, is open and functioning now and programming is underway and we'll be adding additional programming as, uh, as terms, summer term and the fall terms progress. That center uh, cements our presence in the region where, and this is our mantra, where lives can be transformed, we can unlock potential, we can fuel the economy for all, and they can help the community to thrive. So we're very grateful for your support for our work in East County and, of course, for your support for the breadth of our programs. Uh, and please do support uh, approve the appropriation request for, um, for Montgomery College. And thank you. We greatly appreciate your trust in um, in us and in the in, in our mission. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Under budget again, our next speaker, Chelsea Zhu. <laughs> Just hit your button on the right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and members of the Montgomery County Council. My name is Chelsea, and I'm a sophomore at Richard Montgomery High School. For the 2024 to 2025 budget, I am advocating in support of prioritizing spending towards cultivating the green infrastructure around our county. Green infrastructure is using nature, nature as an essential component to environmental and urban planning, creating a healthy space around neighborhoods, town centers, schools, libraries, and community facilities. It can look like rain gardens, rooftops with vegetation, planter boxes, and these plans tackle crucial issues such as waste management, erosion, and pollution. Not only does green infrastructure also entail economic benefits, but it also improves the quality of life for all residents. We're seeing green infrastructure turn into a priority nationwide. In Philadelphia, the greening plan they implemented could absorb or help the city avoid some 1.5 billion pounds of carbon dioxide annually, which is equal to removing 3,400 cars off the road. In our neighboring county, Howard County has developed a green infrastructure network to map the forests, wetlands, meadows, and waterways. They have transformed green infrastructure into an approach for ecological conservation for budding plants and animal life for residents to cherish. But when we're thinking about 
environmental equity, and climate justice, the spaces of Montgomery County drastically change depending on which road we take. Many areas lack sustainable green infrastructure and spaces, and we don't have enough transparency on the data, which is exacerbated by the effects of global warming. In fact, the increased heat, rainfall, and unpredictable weather affects communities most vulnerable without green buffers that can protect their homes. Some of my precious memories in Montgomery County take place where I'm able to enjoy the green spaces all around me. And I can speak to many of my friends and family members who have remembered the red maple trees, Black Eyed Susans, gardens, forests, and snapshots of nature that have illuminated our life. So council members, I want to emphasize bringing sustainability to the budget and letting our futures grow of green. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker, Lucia Vasquez. Buenas noches, Presidente del Consejo, Andrew Frickton, y miembro del Condado, Concejal Natalie. Usted es parte de mi distrito. Y ahí estuvo presente el día de la acción. Una disculpa por la omisión. ¿Sí? Mi nombre es Lucía Vázquez y soy líder comunitaria. Hoy voy a hablar sobre la importancia de preservar las viviendas asequibles en nuestro condado. Los apartamentos de Washington West salieron a la venta en diciembre del 2022. Los residentes, con el apoyo de Acción de Montgomery, se reunieron con el ejecutivo del condado, el señor Elrich, la concejal Fanny González, y el Departamento de Vivienda y Asuntos Comunitarios y varias otras entidades. Y solicitamos al condado la preservación de viviendas asequibles en nuestro complejo de apartamentos. Debido a que había fondos suficientes en la iniciativa de fondos de vivienda, el condado pudo ejercer su derecho de primera nego negación y comprar Washington West, que pronto vendió a una organización con, sin fines de lucro, con el fin de preservar las 345 viviendas como viviendas asequibles. He vivido en Westchester West durante más de ocho años. Para mí y mi familia esto significó poder quedarnos en el lugar que llamamos hogar, sabiendo que nuestro alquiler no iba a aumentar drásticamente y poder planificar nuestros gastos. A mi hijo le encanta la escuela y nuestros vecinos son como nuestra familia. En realidad fue la misma para, esta realidad fue la misma para las 345 familias que viven en este complejo de apartamentos porque durante el proceso de negociación se nos aseguró que el aumento anual de alquiler no sería superior al 5.8%. Queremos agradecer al Consejo y al Ejecutivo por aumentar constantemente el Fondo de Iniciativa de Vivienda, urgirles a ustedes que continúen haciéndolo nuevamente este año. En particular, como AIEM, apoyamos los 20 millones iniciales para el Fondo de Preservación sin fines de lucro, con el objetivo de llegar a 50 millones para que podamos ahorrar y apoyar a personas como yo y mis vecinos y permitirnos quedarnos en nuestros hogares y mantenerlos asequibles durante más tiempo. Gracias. Good evening, uh, Council President Andrew Fritzen and members of the County Council. And uh, Natalie Fanny Gonzalez, you are my district uh, council member. Thank you for coming on the 17th of March to the Day of Action. And my apologies for not acknowledging that on that day. Uh, my name is Lucia Vasquez and I am a community leader. Today I am going to talk about the importance of preserving affordable housing in our county. The Westchester West Apartments went on sale in December 2022. Residents with the support of Action in Montgomery met with uh, County Executive Mr. Elkridge, Council Member Fanny Gonzalez, uh, the Department of Housing and Community Affairs, and several other entities requested that we ensure the preservation of affordable housing in our building complex. Because the sufficient funds were in the Housing Fund Initiative, the county was able to exercise its rights, its, its right of first refusal and purchase uh, Westchester West, which is soon sold to a nonprofit organization with the goal of preserving the 345 homes as affordable housing. I have lived in the Westchester West for over eight years. For me and my family, this meant being able to stay in the place we call uh, we call our home, knowing our rent was not going to go up and we were going to be able to plan our expenses. 
My son loves the school and our neighbors are like our family. This reality was the same for more than 345 families living in the apartment complex because during the negoti negotiation process, we were assured that the annual rent increase will not be, will not be more than 5.8%. We want to thank the, count, the council and the executive for consistently increasing the housing initiative fund and to urge you to continue to do so again this year. In particular, as AIM, we support the initial 20 million for the nonprofit preservation fund with the goal of getting it to 50 million so we can save and support people like my neighbors and me being able to stay in our homes and keep them affordable over time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Supriya Mordecai. Supriya. Good evening. Um, my name is Supriya, and I'm speaking here before you today as a resident of Montgomery County for over 20 years. In my time here, I have lived with my single immigrant mother and have seen many different paths of life, and one that is far too common that shouldn't be is living within the cycle of poverty. Many times, I witness people who are vulnerable or marginalized by society often struggle to figure out a way out of their current circumstances. The support given by Montgomery County government is helpful, but oftentimes not enough or cumbersome to navigate, and therefore we find ourselves in need of the support of the nonprofit organizations that are far and wide here in the county. When these organizations are stretched thin, however, it should call to your attention that there is a further societal problem that needs a higher level of support. As someone who is not only a Montgomery County resident, but also a social service provider here in the county, I've seen many different sides of living in poverty. From those experiencing homelessness due to limited access to appropriate childcare, transportation issues, and evictions, to the side of poverty that most people teeter on, where one bill can completely alter a family's life and put them in a state of survival mode, where they are having to go to grant links to make ends meet. These are the families that work two or three jobs, have limited time with their children due to work schedules and exhaustion, and are inundated with incoming bills for utilities, food, rent, and transportation. In these times of a family's life, programs that provide emergency financial assistance, as well as free resources, such as food and clothes, can make all the difference when families may have exhausted all other options or are worn out from having to decide whether or not paying a bill will take priority over eating that week. Of course, we would love to get to a point in time where these programs are no longer needed and self-sufficiency is in sight for everyone, but that day is not here and that day is not on the horizon for many people who these systems continuously fail day in and day out. With your help in making sure that we continue to provide the best support we can as a community, these nonprofits can continue to bridge the gaps that the systems in place have created. Please look to these programs as a means of prevention and security for the citizens of Montgomery County. I know the county is committed to ending childhood hunger. Programs such as food pantries, emergency financial assistance programs, and clothing distribution centers should be embedded in the county budget as they provide essential services to children and families as defined by the county. The programs also provide a sense of belonging and dignity to people who more often than not do not have the time or the means to think about anything other than surviving. I hope to live in a county where all of our citizens can thrive one day. Thank you. Thank you, Supriya. Next speaker, Heidi Garcia. Good evening, members of the County Council. My name is Heidi Garcia, and I am a lead English language development teacher at Burnt Mills Elementary School, a community school committed to serving and empowering our community. There are many stories, experiences, and memories I could share that have impacted our school community, but I was told I only have three minutes. So I will be blunt and honest and get straight to the point and hope that you will remember Burnt Mills when it is time for you to get into your cars to drive home tonight to be safe and warm with your families. As a teacher, I will drive home to be with my family too, but the difference between you and I is that I carry the weight of knowing that families walk through our school doors almost every day in search of basic needs such as health care, disability assistance, internet, employment, English language classes, transportation, or just walking in with eviction notices and wondering when their next meal will be. Yes, as a teacher, this is the job I signed up for. It is the selfless work that God reminds me of every day as to why I chose this profession. However, we all know that if your social, emotional, and physical well-being needs are not met, your chances at being available to learn are pretty low. My purpose, or my why, is our students and families. I fight every day alongside all Burt Mill staff to make sure our students and their families have what they need to just make it through to the next day. 
However, our staff can only handle so much at once. With our farm's population currently being 74% and projected to be 84% next year, our current resources are limited. We have spent late nights, many weekends, and countless hours, like today, looking for resources and calling organizations to find the right support for our families, in addition to fulfilling our roles as educators to provide our students with a quality education. We try our best every day to serve our community with the support we have, but there are many days our best is just not enough. Our resources and our current supports in place are just not enough. My ask is for you to provide funding in this year's budget for a Linkages to Learning program for Burnt Mills. A qualification for Linkages is an Ever Farms rate of over 60%. Burnt Mills is currently at 74% this year with an anticipation of our percentage to only raise higher. An opportunity for Linkages at Burnt Mills would lay the foundation of support and resources needed that will help our students in our community. Our students and families deserve to get the proper support they need to be successful when they walk through our school doors and when they leave to go home every day to be with their families, just like you and I. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel, Angie Logan Pope, Daniel Suh, Tanya Aguilar, Flora Vellis, Dustin Jeter, Jasmine Arias. Angie, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Good evening, Council President Friedson and distinguished members of the Montgomery County Council. My name is Angie Logan Pope, and I am a proud MCPS parent and the PTA president of Burnt Mills Elementary School in Silver Spring, Council District 5. As a former school teacher in Montgomery County, I understand the importance of uplifting our schools, which in turn uplifts our community. This is especially essential when serving a Title I community-based school. I share in our principal, Dr. Stacy Ashton's motto that at Burnt Mills, we don't just enroll children, we enroll families. So we are asking you to please include funding for the Linkages to Learning program to be implemented at Burnt Mills Elementary School this upcoming school year. In just four years, the percentage of children who qualify for free and reduced meals at Burnt Mills Elementary has increased from 62% in 2019 to 74% currently. That's over a 10% increase with a 9% increase in the past two years alone. In the field and on the ground, this has created a dramatic change in our school community. The numbers tell the story and Burnt Mills feels the impact daily. The projected increase for those qualifying for farms for the upcoming school year is 84%, which would make a nearly 20% increase within the past five years. In listening to our parents and teachers, we understand that the increase is because refugee settlement agencies have made agreements with the Enclave Apartments for Housing, which is within the Burnt Mills Elementary School District. I appreciate that our county welcomes those who are escaping war and danger, and I am so proud that our school staff has been going above and beyond to play a role in embracing every child and their family who walks through our doors. Our school has taken on the responsibility of providing essential and basic needs, such as assisting families in finding health care, finding jobs, learning English, providing clothing, food, and more. This is why I'm here today, pleading for financial assistance from our county. We cannot continue to do this alone. We need help immediately. We believe the addition of the Leakage to Learning program at Burnt Mills can go a long way towards supporting the many critical needs of our children and their families to include behavioral and mental health attention. I ask that in this year's budget, you include funding for the Linkage to Learning program to be implemented at Burt Mills Elementary School. Thank you for your consideration of this request. Thank you. Our next speaker, Daniel Suh. Is Daniel Suh here? 
Okay, our next speaker, Tanya Aguilar. Good evening. It's really nice to see some familiar faces from Saturday's uh, Latin dance uh, show that we had with our first inaug or our inaugural um, elementary school Latin dance show. So I'm really nice. It's really nice to see you all here. Many of you here again. Um, but good evening. Good evening. I'm Tanya Aguilar, and I'm the proud community school liaison at Twinbrook Elementary School. And I'm here before you today to advocate for the crucial investment in opening a linkages to learning program at Twinbrook Elementary School. Twinbrook Elementary School is a Title I school, um, and, and we are also in our second year as a community school. And it is also my second year there as a community school liaison. A community school is, for some, many, many people that don't know about what a community school is, it's defined by a Senate bill um, as fostering a strategic partnership to enhance student achievement, positive learning environments, and student well-being through wraparound services. And I believe that we truly are achieving that at Twinbrook Elementary School. We serve a diverse population with black, white, Asian, and Hispanic students comprising the majority. This diversity underscores the importance of addressing varied needs within our community. And we are immensely grateful to County Executive Elrich and the council, council members for recognizing the pressing need and uh, for establishing linkages to learning as a program within our school community. And so we've been asked, I've been asked, well, you already are a community school, so why would you need a linkages to learning program? Well, while community schools provides essential support, the answer lies in the breadth and in the depth that linkages to learning can provide for our families at Twinbrook. Linkages to learning provides families with integrating health, social services, community engagement, and leadership development. This holistic approach not only supports student learning, but also nurtures strong families and fosters healthy communities. It provides a comprehensive whole family focus and recognizes what we need to support a family and support the child. Currently, the dedicated staff at Twinbrook Elementary School strive to support families with limited resources. As a community school, we're successful in establishing a partnership with the Capital Area Food Bank last year and now hold a food distribution event once a month. And we welcome no less than 250 families every month that, that serves 800 to 1,000 individuals within our school community, most of which are children. I assist an average of 20 families per week in securing basic resources such as rental assistance, health insurance, legal assistance, English classes, etc., etc. And um, I've been successful with my team in establishing strong relationships with community partners such as So What Else, Interfaith Works, I Support the Girls, and we secure things such as diapers and baby items, home goods, clothing, female hygiene items, and more for the families. But despite all of these efforts, it's we are in need of so much more. And um, I implore the committee to prioritize funding for expanding our personnel capacity, particularly in the realm of care management at Twinbrook Elementary School. Thank you. In investing in linkages. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for your much. testimony. Our next speaker, Flor Velas. Buenas noches, Presidente del Consejo de Montgomery, Fre Señor Freyson y Concejales. Mi nombre es Flor Belli y soy líder comunitaria de Hewitt Avenue y voy a hablar sobre el programa Excel Bayon de Bell Elementary. Mis hijos acuden a la escuela comunitaria a primaria Harmony Hill. Harmony Hill es una escuela comunitaria de título 1 que ofrece el programa IBB. Estoy muy agradecida porque este programa beneficia a muchas familias trabajadoras. Gracias a este programa, Hemos podido trabajar de manera cercana con la escuela y mi comunidad. Debido al equipo de acción en Montgomery, ha trabajado organizando a los padres en diferentes ocasiones y en diferentes motivos. Antes de conocer acción en Montgomery, mi, part mi participación en la escuela era bien limitada y mi participación comunitaria era bien mínima. He participado en campañas de educación, eh, seguridad peatonal y salud dental, junto con otras madres y padres de familia de la escuela. Hemos creado la asociación de inquilinos en el complejo de apartamentos donde vivimos, participando activamente, defendiendo nuestros derechos como inquilinos. La organización de padres no solo ayuda a los padres a involucrarse en las escuelas, ha tenido un, un impacto en mi vida 
en muchas áreas y me ha hecho comprender el poder de trabajar juntos por el bienestar de nuestros niños y nuestra comunidad. Les pido a todos los miembros del consejo que continúen apoyando el programa IBBE y que sigan apoyando con los fondos para la organización de los padres como parte de este programa que se ha incluido en el presupuesto del Ejecutivo del Condado. Gracias. Good evening, Council President Fritzen and Council Members. My name is Flor Beliz and I am a community leader from Hewitt Avenue and I am going to talk about the program Excel beyond the Bell Elementary School. My children attend Harmony Hills Elementary School. Harmony Hills is a school community in Title I school that also offers the EBBE program. I am very grateful because this program benefits many working families. Thanks to the program that we have, I was able to work closely with the school and the community because Action in Montgomery has worked organizing parents on different occasions and for different reasons. Before knowing about Action in Montgomery, my involvement at the school was very limited, in limited situations, and with minimal community involvement. I have participated in education, pedestrian safety, and uh, health campaigns. Together with other mothers and fathers of the school, we have created the Tenants Association in the apartment complex where we live, participating actively in defending our rights as tenants. The parent organization does not only help get parents involved in the schools, but also it has had an impact in my life in many ways. It has made me understand the power of working together for the well-being of our children in our community. I ask all the members of the council to continue supporting the EPBE program and to continue providing funds for parents' organization as part of this program, which has been included in the county executive's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Dustin Jeter. Thank you for your time this evening. My name is Dustin Jeter. I'm a social studies teacher at James Huber Blake High School, as well as a 19-year veteran in MCPS and the Montgomery County native resident and voter. I'm here today to urge you to provide for our students and educators the resources that they need to be successful by increasing the funds in the proposed MCPS budget. As an elementary school student at Cold Spring Elementary School, I have a vivid memory of the first time I didn't turn an assignment in. I was mortified by the experience as a young student who was striving to do my best. You see, we were tasked with building a diagram out of a milk carton. Uh, at my house, we didn't drink milk out of a carton, we drank it out of a jug. So I, of course, as a kid, didn't say anything to anyone and until the due date when it was to my turn to turn in the assignment. My teacher asked me, why didn't you turn in the assignment? I had to, at that day, um, explain to her the reason why I didn't complete the project. I didn't have the resources at that time. I learned an important lesson that day through the grace of my teacher. She told me that if I had asked for what I needed, she would have been able to make a provision for me to get that. Um, and she told me that I should always ask for what I need or I would never get anything. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Zudke for that today. Uh, I'm here yet again to do what Montgomery County Board of Education will not do. I'm here to ask for a budget that actually meets the needs of our students and our educators. It's still no secret that we're dealing with a crisis in the field of education. Educators are working hard to provide a solid education for our students, but each year we're being asked to do more with more students, with more needs, and less resources. Those who say that we already get enough resources don't know how MCPS currently has uh, an instructional materials budget freeze that we deal with or have dealt with for a number of months now. They don't know about the staffing allocations for next year that are already pointing to increased class sizes. One of the biggest issues is the lack of funding to implement our educational program with Fidelity. The situation impacts every level of our schools, but I would like to point out for our elementary school educators who are not given enough individual planning time to meet, meet the needs of their individual students. Also, a lack of available substitutes requires that when an educator is out, all of the other students from that class are, are scattered into classes of other students of their grade, instantly increasing the class size for that day. This is a daily occurrence for our educators. Stories of educators scrambling to drag desks from other rooms so that they'll have a place for those new students to work are a daily occurrence. 
Uh, we also have hired more conditionally certified educators than uh, ever before, and we need support for those educators. So I'm asking for help by investing $21.3 million in additional subject, special subject classes for elementary school students so that the educators would have more planning time, invest in additional three consulting teachers to help those teachers who need the additional help, and bring back our Go Guardian program to allow the educators to provide a safe learning environment while being able to manage large class sizes. Lastly, I would say that the argument has come up that uh, MCPS needs more accountability. We agree, I agree, but offering uh, more accountability without resources is not fair for our students and not fair for our educators. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our last speaker on this panel, Jasmine Arias. Hello, members of the County Council. My name is Jasmine Arias, and I am a sophomore at Northwood High School. I ask that you add money to the MCS budget so that we can maintain current levels of funding for restorative justice coach stipends. I support restorative justice, or RJ, because it allows us to recreate a future with a better school climate. RJ can also shrink the school to prison pipeline because it's able to reduce the suspensions and keep kids from getting arrested. State data shows that last year, black MCS students were nearly five times more likely to receive an out-of-school suspension or expulsion than white MCS students. The Office of Legislative Oversight also reported that black children were twice as likely to be suspended or referred to juvenile services compared to their share of student enrollment. I also see that the school to prison pipeline is a problem at my specific school. A friend of mine was suspended multiple times within the same month. I think about what would happen if I went in her shoes. I wonder how could I build a relationship with my teachers or if I could keep my friends if I kept getting kicked out of school. I wonder what kind of help I would receive that I can catch up to my schoolwork, or would I fall behind? And most of all, I wonder if I would want to go to school, and if I want to go to learn anything at all. I don't think I would. If suspensions were effective at getting students to learn their lesson, then we wouldn't see the same student get suspended so frequently. Luckily, we know that restorative justice can help shrink schools to prison pipeline. First, RJ improves school culture because it focuses on improving relationships based on trust and better communication. RJ assists students in recognizing, regulating emotions and emphasizing values of respect, kindness, and responsibility so that teachers can make better choices. These students' proactive culture-building values can help avoid problems before they begin. If harm does occur, a trained RJ coach can help students understand the root causes of problems that do not happen again. Preliminary data shows that 80% of RJ service calls do not repeat the violation. Despite these promising results, RJ is at risk of being cut. You, the county council, have the power to make things right and better for my friends, classmates, and ultimately yourselves. We are the next generation of Montgomery County leaders, and we need restorative justice to thrive. Please add more money to the MCS budget so we can maintain FY24 coach stipend funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to take a three-minute recess, very brief uh, recess, three minutes. We're going to keep the public feed running so we don't have to restart it. The next panel that's going to be up and ready in three minutes is Shaquille Stewart, Junie Kim, Tracy Espinoza, Jim Bogish Mahesha, Allison Gillespie, and Kemba Kane. Uh, we will reconvene at 8.41.
Okay, if you're ready, Shaquille Stewart, Junie Kim, Tracy Espinoza, Jim Bogish, Mahesha, Allison Gillespie, and Kemper Kane. Perfect. Shaquille Stewart, when you're ready, just hit that button on the right in front of you, and you have three minutes. Good evening, council members. Um, my name is Shaquille Stewart. I am an actor, teacher, and the current executive director of Silver Spring Stage. None of that would have been possible without Montgomery College. Um, I'm here today to um, both thank you for your continued support of the budget as well as to say some great things about MC um, and then also to um, implore that you continue supporting MC uh, for the uh, operating budget request. So um, I am from Montgomery College, excuse me, I'm from Montgomery County, I'm a little nervous, um, but I was born and raised in Silver Spring right around the corner. Um, like my entire family, I graduated from Albert Einstein High School, um, but unlike the rest of my family, I was one of the first ones to go to college, um, and I was able to pursue acting. Uh, I got a full scholarship, but unfortunately, as life happens, um, my father had passed away the same year my mom got laid off from her job, so I had to come home and uh, take care of business. Um, but my mom wasn't having no college dropouts in the, in the house, so um, Montgomery College was a unique blessing for me. Um, MC's Performing Arts Program welcomed me. They hired me. They gave me a job. Uh, they prepared me for a successful career in this industry. Um, the tuition is very affordable. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of money, like I said, so it was, um, it was a blessing. Uh, the faculty is amazing, both in the theater as well as in the arts. Um, lots of the professors there are actually working currently in the professional acting industry, which, I mean, for somebody going in, a student, it's amazing to see. Um, they are notable performers. You might have seen some of them on the wire. <laughs> and these professors, they maintain, um, my, they, they become my personal friends, my professional network, and I text them for advice all the time. Um, you know, because of my uh, experience at MC, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. I've had lots of great experiences that have been a direct result of my um, experience at MC. I have traveled the country on tour as Othello. I've performed um, on and off Broadway, um, and as well as in a few theaters in DC, for words only. But this isn't about me, really. This is just about um, how great MC is for the students and the surrounding community. Um, currently, I am the executive director at Silver Spring Stage, and in this leadership role as well as my art Art's goal in general is to help people that look like me get their representation on stage. And this started for me at MC, finding that belonging and representation, because the professors look just like me, so that was cool. Um, I'm proud to be a Montgomery College alum. I'm proud to offer my skills and leadership to the community through my work at Silver Spring Stage. And I'm proud of y'all for supporting MC. I hope that you continue to do that. Please continue your support to keep MC affordable so more residents can access the education they need to succeed. Ooh, three minutes. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker, Junie Kim. Good evening to the County Council. My name is Junie Kim, the co-president at Watkins Mill for the sophomore class council and the president for Young People for Progress. I am here to ask for the council to add funding to the proposed budget so that the extra funding is used to maintain the current restorative justice coach stipends. I would like to begin by sharing my experience with restorative justice. RJ is a set of culture shifting practices that allow students to repair harm and improve relationships through better communication. Last year, we had com conflicts between our teacher and us, the students. This issue caused so much tensions for both the students and the teacher so we were mentally exhausted after every class. To resolve this issue, our teacher decided to implement restorative justice circles every Monday so that we could share our voices. We have two restorative justice coaches to help rekindle the relationship between the students and the teacher. If our teacher tried to handle this situation by herself, it would not have been effective because the neutrality in RJ circles allows for an unbiased perspective that can help guide the conversation. Also, with these restorative justice circles, Without these restorative justice circles, our problem would have snowballed into a much more serious problem that would have had 
that would have impeded our ability to learn. Restorative justice was the key to resolving this conflict because it addressed the root of the problem, that students felt mistreated and that the teacher felt disrespected. This approach took away the need for short-term punitive punishments such as suspensions and detentions, which do not address the underlying problem. We were able to come to a more effective and lasting solution. Restorative justice is proven to decrease the school-to-prison pipeline as well. The Maryland Commission on the School-to-Prison Pipeline and Restorative Practices found that schools in Maryland are too reliant on a zero-tolerance policy. This policy can make the school environment worse and might even hurt students. So why is MCPS cutting funds on something that helps combat this reliance on the zero tolerance policies? The commission found that this policy affects students of color and students with disabilities. The commission, oh, more than others, leading to an increased number of these students being removed from school, school and entering the criminal justice system. Investing in these RJ positions is not just a matter of improving the school environment. It's about enhancing the educational experience for our students. It's about acknowledging that every student deserves a safe space to learn and grow without the fear of bias or discrimination. I strongly urge the council to add extra funding to maintain restorative justice coach stipends, not cut them. This is not just an investment in our schools, but an investment in our future. Thank you for your time and consideration. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Our next speaker, Tracy Espinosa. Good evening, County Council members. My name is Tracy Espinoza, and I'm a sophomore at Watkins Mill High School and also a member of Young People for Progress. We mobilize students to win a more racially, and ju more racially just and fair school system, but we also understand that it's a challenging school year for the budget and that it's difficult to have decisions made because of um, these financial restraints, but that shouldn't come with the cost of our students' well-being. The future of MCPS students falls on your hands tonight as I ask for your support in adding more funding to the MCPS proposed budget so we can maintain restorative justice funding at the current level. Most of MCPS's restorative justice efforts are to build a positive, inclusive school culture that makes students want to go to school. Yet conflict is unavoidable for everyone because we all face negative emotions like sadness, loneliness, and anger. If we lash out and harm someone, the response from the school can widely differ. There is one major flaw with traditional exclusionary discipline. It does not solve the root issue. Instead, it instills fear into the student, isolates them from their school environment, and leaves them prone to falling victim to the school-to-prison pipeline. If a student does something wrong, yes, they should be held accountable, but they should also have access to resources that will help them overcome the trigger that fueled the incident. The incident. This is what restorative justice is. Though we have the chance to help students and tackle the problem that they face at the root, MCPS is proposing to cut restorative justice coach stipends, leaving multiple restorative justice coach positions and students vulnerable. I needed restorative justice the most when I was nearly suspended at school last year for a misunderstanding with administration. I needed it when I was racially targeted, though my school is minority majority. In fact, we spoke with some students and 60% of them thought that race slash ethnicity was somewhat or a major factor in determining school disciplinary outcomes. Students in MCPS need restorative justice in a system that was designed to hand them a slashed deck of cards. Tonight, I lay the groundwork for our future fight as students continue to advocate for their well-being and investment in their future, and that starts with ensuring that we allocate the proper resources needed to target issues fostered from various environments that students are in at the root. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Jimbogish Mahesha. Good evening. My name is Gumbog Shmashesha, um, education, educated and experienced professional from Ethiopia. I have a master's degree in gender and development and a BA degree in international relations. However, despite my efforts, I couldn't get job and I'm trying. My advocacy agenda is the challenge of women scholars coming from different countries and facing employment. My ask today, today 
I'm here to advocate for the development of programs specific or targeting to educated, highly experienced women who need help finding ways to make use of their expertise in leading people, leading change, and building coalition. My story is not unique. There are so many women facing and sharing similar experiences in this country, especially in Montgomery County. The benefit of addressing this, it improves in Montgomery County, this improves the economic status, the situation, the health, the health, the health uh, um, disparities, and economic and the social equity and entrepreneur movement. Even there is no data regarding this educated, experienced, and skilled women living in Montgomery County. Because of this, I conducted a research and uh, informal interview with those women, and I discovered that the hiring officials, they do not consider their expertise, their knowledge, and they are not hiring them west of their talents for the county. To add more, the, according to the, the census in Montgomery County, 51.34% of, 51 of Montgomery County population are women. 34.1% of the county's foreign born population. 25% of immigrants with foreign degree are unemployed or underemployed. One in non-citizen workers are living in low income and poverty. Failure to address the value of skills of this woman contribute to the county for the county loss of Montgomery County and revenue, untapped resource, and potential job creators. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Allison Gillespie. Good evening. Hello. I'm here tonight to ask that you fully fund the budget request from Parks. It's my understanding that the executive's budget would make a cut to that request and actually reduce what we know as same services, as in the same services we've been used to for a very long time. Uh, every single resident, I feel like I come here and I say this to you like every six months, every single resident in this county can take advantage of our excellent award-winning park system for free at any time. And that's an amazing and equitable resource we provide that gives people a place to exercise, to play, to meditate a place to get a huge dose of mental and physical health benefits. And our parks also provide a huge dose of ecosystem services and economic benefits to the county. But these parks, they need to be safe and clean and well-maintained for everyone. Um, cuts to the parks operating budget would result in reductions of a lot of really important essential things. I was actually shocked to find, this, find out this list. It would include trash removal on playgrounds, porta potties, why are we thinking about reducing porta bodies? That's crazy to me. And I don't even think I have to explain why. I hope I don't have to explain why. Um, log jam removals and streams. I'll give you an example from that one. As a trail liaison recently, um, I was watching them remove um, logs that had built up under a bridge right where cedar meets beach. Um, so this is evidence that this is every single one of your districts. Every part of this county would be impacted. If those trees weren't removed, that road would have flooded and the beltway could have even flooded. So these are essential services. Another thing that could be cut would be tree cutting and pruning. And as a trail liaison, not only do I see examples where trees have fallen across trails, making trails inaccessible or dangerous for weeks if they're not removed, months, um, but that could also be dangerous on playgrounds. And I know in our local uh, 
playground. There was one year where they did not, they made a decision to do this about 10 years ago, and we had several large branches fall just six or seven feet away from where kids were playing. Why are we thinking of cutting these things? This impacts all of us. Um, I, I guess, um, you know, another example that kind of shocked me was we need security in our parks and our trails, and that would come under this cut. That impacts all of us, and that's a really bad thing to get rid of at a time when people really, really, really don't have many options, and going outside someplace safe that's free to go to, why would we put that in danger? Um, I guess at a bare minimum, we need to fund the people, the staff, the, the people that maintain our parks on our citizens' behalf. I, um, I'll leave you with this one thought. I was in Virginia last week, and I pulled up to a parking lot to... Uh, okay, I'm going to tell you what it said. There's a big sign in Virginia, and it said in huge letters, great parks make great communities. And you all know this. Don't cut the parks operating budget, please. Thank you for your testimony. Our final speaker on this panel, Kemba Kane. Good evening, council members. My name is Kember Kane. I'm a proud kindergarten teacher at Westover Elementary School, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the educators of Montgomery County. Um, I'm asking that you recognize the positive growth that we've seen in this last year. Reading learning is on a strong upward trend. Math as well. MCPS students are doing amazing things. You can peruse the evidence of this growth at the MCPS data dashboards attached to my testimony. As we appreciate the persistent hard work and dedication that was required for this growth, educators now look to the community for support to continue these upward trends in student success. It is important for everyone to understand our reality. We educators are in the challenge of our lives. At no time in history have educators faced what we're facing now kids in destru destructive and disruptive chaos, parents and medical professionals at a loss with what to do about it, administrators focused on control as if somehow micromanagement is going to solve any problems. Outside organizations are attacking everything from our libraries to our perceived responsibility toward the issue of the month. Let's be clear, this has entrenched understaffing into our daily reality. No one will do what we do. Everyone had a shot during the pandemic. Where are the administrators that fell back in love with teaching and decided to pivot to the classroom? Where are the parents who saw their child grow and learn in the virtual delivery system who were called to serve as educators? Where are the community members who saw our reality and jumped into our work? A groundswell of people choosing to educate children did not happen after the pandemic, and it will not happen anytime soon. So who is going to carry our students forward? We are. Those staff who continue to stick around and sacrifice their own needs to try to meet the needs of our children, that's us. The proposed budget is a punishment for deplorable actions that were committed under the name of MCPS by individuals who are long gone. Please remember that we were the victims. And an underfunded MCPS punishes the educators who stayed, the parents who stayed, and worst of all, our students. An underfunded MCPS budget would be a thinly veiled vote of no confidence for all of us who stood firm and carried the yoke of public education over the last four years. Stand with us, please. Do not use your response on this budget to discourage us. Use your response on this budget to inspire us. Work with us to locate the resources that we need to succeed, to continue to succeed fully fund the MCPS budget. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next panel, Demetrius Henriquez, Diana Gonzalez Ramirez, Afaani Fuller, Notori Green, Jamie Harper, and Amabogi Amad Amadasu. Demetrius, when you're ready, you have three minutes. 
Hello, County Council, and thank you for taking the time to hear my testimony. Uh, my name is Demetrius Enriquez. I live in the Gateway community in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, I'm here today representing Ride On's Transit Advisory Group, and also I'm just a avid uh, bus rider. Um, I first want to start off by recognizing um, how blessed we are as a county um, to have a service like Ride On that's providing um, affordable and accessible transportation uh, for all of our residents. Uh, I've lived in and been in other suburbs where the kind of service that we receive here is uh, frankly unheard of. Um, and every time I ride the bus, I'm grateful for the freedom that it gives me. Um, not having to worry about parking, uh, gas, not sh having to worry about the stress of traffic. Uh, I could go on and list the benefits, but to get to the point of why I'm here, um, the county needs to continue investing in this service. Um, for the well-being of our residents and our environment, we have to prioritize transit and walkability. Um, the only way we are going to reach uh, those safety and climate goals is going to be by reducing the number of cars on our road. Um, there have been numerous studies showing the devastating externalities of cars and their associated infrastructure. Uh, most recently, there was a study out of the UK, Car Harm, a Global Review of Automobility's Harm to People and the Environment. Um, the researchers there lay out these devastating externalities in a very methodical, in a very scientific way, much better than I can do in three minutes. Um, so I encourage everybody, and especially the council members, to at least skim through. Um, they have lots of great graphics that can show why we need to move away from, from that uh, style of development. Um, you can find the paper online, the entire paper. It's not paywalled at sciencedirect.com. Um, so then to get people out of their cars, we also need to be providing convenient and reliable alternatives. Um, as it stands now, driving is still the most convenient mode of transportation for most county residents. Um, just looking at driving times versus transit times on Google Maps can show you this. Um, to yeah, Speaking to me personally, um, it, if I had chosen to drive here, it would have only taken me 12 minutes. Um, by transit, it takes 30 minutes and a transfer at Shady Grove or a 49 minute straight shot. And for anybody counting, I took the 49 minute straight shot. Uh, to, to my work every day, it's 10 minutes by car uh, or by bus, it takes 26 minutes and a transfer. Um, for somebody like me who's a transit enthusiast, I'm willing to put up with that every day, but for most people, that's, uh, you know, they're gonna pick the car. And frankly, some days I do still pick the car. Um, so while even having options is a very big win, uh, we cannot stop there if we're serious about the health and safety of our county residents. Um, I recently joined the Transit Advisory Group, and having attended just one of their meetings, uh, one thing became very obvious. Um, Ride On and their staff have the capability to make the service one of the most convenient and reliable ways to get around the county. We have the opportunity to become the suburbs of the future. A shining, we can be a shining example of what well-funded transit can look like. All we need is for you to empower them. Um, to end, I'd like to thank the council one more time for the past support of uh, Ride On. Uh, with your investment, they have been able to create an amazing service around the county. But I remind again that we must not get complacent. Please give right on your full support. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Diana Gonzalez Ramirez. Good evening, uh, Council President Friedson and members of the City Council. My name is Diana Gonzalez Ramirez. I'm a Montgomery County resident and a Montgomery College Performing Arts graduate. I'm here tonight to advocate on behalf of MC. I ask for your continued fiscal support of the institution that helped me launch my theater career. While I have lived in Gaithersburg for many years, I was born in El Salvador. My family immigrated to the United States when I was five years old. We moved to Montgomery County when I was 15 years old. We moved to Maryland specifically due to its status as a dreamer-friendly state, as I was soon to be granted DACA status. After graduating from Richard Montgomery High School, I always knew Montgomery College would be the place where I would begin my higher education journey. Coming from a modest background, MC made college possible for me. Without Montgomery College's affordable tuition and scholarships, I simply would not have been able to pursue a degree and ultimately my career. I've dreamed of working in the theater since childhood. MC's performing arts program is well known for its incredible faculty. They are strong teachers, visionary artists, and many of them are established professional actors. They perform throughout the DC area and have created a powerful reputation for MC. My professors prepared me well. I learned to develop my craft, but also about set design, lighting, and costuming, all important skills for a well-rounded theater professional. I can now walk into any venue with great confidence and knowledge. Today, I am proud to say I have a thriving career. The DMV has a large theater industry. We're actually the third largest in the nation, only behind New York and Chicago. So opportunities are abundant. I'm honored to have performed in a variety of venues, including Black Rock Center for the Arts here in Germantown, Call Hispanic Theater in DC, First Stage in Virginia, and Chesapeake Shakespeare in Baltimore, to name a few. 
Currently, I'm set to shoot my first independent film in Silver Spring. I sit here as proof that your investment in MC yields results. And I'm not alone. Uh, like my colleague Shaquille, many performing arts alumni are professional actors around the area and beyond. MC has a terrific reputation for producing great performers and technicians. Employers know MC's alumni are skilled, hardworking, and ready to succeed. I am so proud to be a Montgomery College Performing Arts alum. And I'm proud to be here thanking you for supporting MC. I ask for your continued support so more residents can access the arts education we as a society so desperately need. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Our next speaker, Afeani Fuller. Um, good evening, members of the board. My name is Afiani Fuller. I am a junior at Montgomery Blair High School, and I'm here to advocate for the increase of transit, especially for students. As a concerned member of the community and a student within the Down County Consortium, otherwise known as the DCC of Montgomery County, I am here to advocate for an increase in transportation funding within this opera operating budget. The current transportation infrastructure does not adequately serve the needs of our diverse student population, hindering their access to education and contributing to mental health challenges. With the student population of 10,800 within the DCC, it is unacceptable that only four routes serve five high schools, leaving many students with accessible transportation options to school. This lack of reliable transportation results in students missing important class time, negatively impacting their academic performance. Additionally, the average of Asian, Black, and Hispanic students in the DCC is 32.68%, on an average of 63.3% utilized farms. Many of these students are children of immigrants who may be facing economic hardships and don't have personal modes of transportation. These students rely on the county bus system as a lifeline to access education, extracurricular activities, and job opportunities for them and even their families. The Right on Reimagine study represents a step towards addressing these issues with a focus on safety, environmental sustainability, and equitable access. The proposed budget for FY25 falls short of meeting the growing needs of our community. We must allocate additional resources to improve our transportation system and ensure that every student has equal access to education. Every day that buses don't improve, students are missing more and more school. There's a 2021 Brown University study that found out excessively long commute times are linked to poor school attendance, including chronic absenteeism. Similarly, a 2019 John Hopkins University study associated each additional 10 minutes in a high school student's commute with missing an extra third day of school. For example, if a student misses the school bus, they may think to take the ride on bus. But one bus takes 35 minutes to come, resulting in them being late. However, you may think, what about walking? Well, most schools in the DCC are along highways and high traffic roads, making it dangerous for students to commute. Furthermore, the mental health of our students is also at stake. School has become increasingly challenging with academic pressures mounting every day. Children have difficulties getting to school and may experience stress and anxiety about being late, which can result in missing classes and low grades. This can cause feelings of frustration and inadequacy negatively impacting their mental health. I speak from personal experience when I say that our current transportation system is failing our students. When my family's car is broken into, leaving me on my primary mode of transportation to school, I was faced with a dilemma. The school bus was not an option because it came too late for my CTE school and I wanted to take the bus, but it took 35 minutes for it to come to my house. I didn't have 35 minutes. Please consider the increase of transit for students because it really helps us to get to school and have our education. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker, Natori Green. Hello, I'm Natori Green and I live in Silver Spring, Maryland. I am here as a paraeducator, an individual on the autism spectrum, and a commissioner on the Intellectual Disability Commission for Montgomery County. It's a long name, but I'm coming here as a concerned citizen instead. Um, basically, I oppose MCPS uh, restructuring Dartstown Autism Learning Center and basically trying to expand their generalized learning center instead. They're also trying to reduce their paraeducators. It is one teacher, two para, two paraeducators, and nine students. They want to reduce it to one paraeducator. 
Um, inside of a generalized learning center, you would have students with very special needs. And in that, it causes more stress for a teacher and paraeducators because there's like diverse sets of things you need to consider. It takes a while for you to get to the education part because you have to really focus on the behavior aspect. It, honestly, most of the time there will be the behavior part. But when you have something that's more dedicated towards somebody with autism or whatever type of need they have, more catered and specialized, you can hone in on helping them advance. It's less about their behavior and more about educating them. Not even just that. Even if they do continue to keep the Downstown Autism Learning Center, they will only have one pair educator for nine students. A teacher is not just an educator. They're a caseworker, they're a behavior specialist, and they are a parent educator as well. Then they're an educator. Now to tell me that a teacher is like expanded so thin and only have one person to assist them with nine students, that's not enough. What I am asking is that you all advocate towards NCPS. I understand you won't be having the budget, but advocate towards them to do better. Because if I'm not mistaken, I wonder if there has been a conversation with teachers and paraeducators regarding this change. I don't think they're pleased. Thank you. Thank you, Natori. Our next speaker, Jamie Harper. Good evening. My name is Jamie Harper, and I'm the parent of a fifth grade student in the Autism Learning Center at Darnstown Elementary School. His name is Richie. Notori, thank you so much for all your words. Um, I echo them, um, but as a parent. So six years ago, when it was time to plan for kindergarten, my family was provided two options, neither of which were good options for our child on the autism spectrum. We were thrilled to learn about a third option, the Autism Learning Center at Darnstown Elementary, where Richie was eventually placed. Richie has been in the Darnstown Autism Learning Center since day one. Every single member of the Learning Center team addresses the complicated needs and IEP goals of its students, all children on the spectrum. There are hundreds of children like Richie in Montgomery County who need and deserve a program like the Darnstown Autism Learning Center. This program inspires learning by providing the greatest public education to each student that enters its doors. It's what parents in Montgomery County have signed up for, and it's what the members of the Board of Education have committed to. By ending the Darnstown Autism Learning Center and cutting paraeducator positions, the Board of Education is breaking that commitment. I can attest to what happens when a child on the spectrum does not have the necessary services and staff ratios to meet IEP goals. Removal of resources is rarely a formula for success. Unfortunately, this is not the first time I have provided testimony because of a proposed cut to a special education program. By comparison, I have yet to testify to the board regarding proposed cuts to my seventh grade daughter's general education programming. Because of the proposed changes, many autistic children in MCPS will not meet their fullest potential, will not be able to achieve the goals set forth in their IEPs and will not have accessible access to the academic, creative problem solving and social emotional skills that they deserve and to which they are entitled. If anything, the Autism Learning Center should be expanded to other elementary school learning centers. MCPS should lead the state and the nation in evidence-based programming for students with autism to improve our children's high school graduation rates and post-secondary outcomes. Let the Autism Learning Center continue to lay the valuable foundation needed for our autistic students to lead a fulfilled life after high school, just as you would any other student in MCPS. I am confident we are committed to the same goal. Please let us work together and help these students by continuing to support, to fund, and to expand the Autism Learning Center at Darnstown. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Our last speaker on this panel, Umbogi Amadasu. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is uh, Umbogi Amadasu. I go by Boogie for those who have a hard time saying my first name. And I am the current um, Lincoln Park um, Civic Association president. Uh, so I'm here on the behalf of uh, Lincoln Park, a community in Rockville. And before I get started, I wanted to know which council member is responsible for, oh, all right, thank, thank you. 
it, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Cat. So, um, but I come here today because uh, I believe the county executive executor, executive had allocated some funds for the Lincoln Park uh, High School. And um, I just, as a resident of Lincoln Park for like the past five years, I walk past I walk past that high school every day, and I seen some of the activity that's gone on. And I definitely want to commend the, the county for, uh, you know, making an investment in that. But it, it, it but it can't stop there. Um, Lincoln Park is a very historical, rich history community that we live in, uh, historically black community. But now we have multiple cultures and races that we all live together in, and. Just my brief time in being there, I can see some of the neglect that's gone on from both the, the city, the city and the county throughout the, the years. So, um, for on the behalf of all the ancestors who've been living in, in Lincoln Park for quite a long time, um, we just hope that the council can consider keeping those funds, you know, allocated to the to the to the school, so then it can further its rehabilitation efforts. So, because I think this is a great opportunity for a renaissance in Lincoln Park. Um, there's a lot of urban blight there. We got a lot of trailers and, and you know, the county public school system has got all their facilities there. But we're hoping that the 2040 plan does work and the county can be a part of that and be a part of the, res the, the renaissance of uh, Lincoln Park. So uh, thank you for your time. And that's all. Thank you very much. Our next panel and final panel in person, Francis Frost, Michael Subin, Sheena Kahende. Tom Precht, Oma Damola Williams, and Gabriel Nagatu. Francis Frost, you have three minutes when you're ready. Council Member Friedson and members of County Council, good evening. I'm Francis Frost and I serve as the president for the Friends of the Library, Montgomery County. Today kicks off National Library Week with the theme Ready, Set, Library. During this week of celebration, we recognize that libraries are a place to connect with others, learn new skills, and to focus on what matters most. And we encourage that this County Council fully support the County Executive's proposed million, $53 million dollar budget for our county library system that will provide the financial backing to implement and expand initiatives to increase equity in access and opportunity. Ready to support our libraries to continue to be a place to connect with others in our diverse community of over a million residents representing many racial groups, ethnicities, religions, and native languages. The proposed budget expands the world languages collections, including resources in Spanish and Chinese. These resources are available to our county county residents who are native speakers, as well as those who are learning these languages. This budget also includes additional funding for more robust staff training and professional development opportunities and support for effective outreach strategies. Each of these initiatives strengthens our residents' ability to connect to each other and further confirms the library as a place to build connections. Ready, set to support our libraries to continue to be a place to learn new skills. The FY25 budget provides the needed resources for more early literacy programs for our youngest residents in English as well as other languages, preparing them for kindergarten and starting them on a path as lifelong readers and learners. During the pandemic, libraries made strategic shifts to continue to provide reading, learning, and entertainment materials to all of us as we were quarantined in our homes. The proposed budget increases the collections acquisitions budget to meet this continued demand for digital materials, allowing county residents to use the Hoopla platform to borrow ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, music, and video, all for free. Ready, set, library. Fully funding the library budget will allow our libraries to be a place to focus on what matters. In addition to being a valuable resource for each and every county resident, libraries represent a freedom that so many of us 
enjoy, freedom of access to reading materials, learning resources, and entertainment, freedom to explore our world and expand our minds. In its 2023 State of the Library, the American Library Association notes the unprecedented call for book bans and the assault on our freedom to read. The Bluest Eye, one of my favorite books, remains consistent on that list of banned books. There's probably a few books that each of you all have read and enjoyed that are also on that list. Our libraries continue to fight this fight for us to have access to read books where we see ourselves, see our neighbors, and see our world, as it is and as it should be, allowing us to choose books for our children and families that reflect who we are and who we want to be. Please fully fund the library budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Michael Subin. President Friedman, Vice President Stewart, members of the council. Uh, my name is Michael Subin. I speak as an individual, although I do support those who have requested an expansion of linkages. My ask of you tonight is that you and Montgomery County Public Schools create an interagency task force to address early childhood programs to address the crying need that we have for, pre, you know, for kindergarten readiness. My understanding is that Steve Silverman spoke to you this afternoon regarding third grade reading. Too late. I think Steve was right on. I'm not criticizing him. But to start to, start to address the problem then is far too late. Back in 2002, the Economic Policy Institute published a report, Inequality at the Starting Gate. Inequality at the Starting Gate. What they did was they looked at socioeconomic status and neighborhood patterns in New York. And what they found was that black and Hispanic students lived in far poorer neighborhoods and had far poorer readiness levels when they entered kindergarten than white children. Coincidentally, Montgomery County at the same time was looking at a study with those exact same patterns and came up with those exact same findings. Disparate, in, disparate impact, de jure segregation. While not a result of any government programs or anything the government did, it is still the reality and we have a moral responsibility to address the needs of those youngsters. We need a significant infusion of dollars to not only the schools but to the communities to create those programs to address those needs, to capture those youngsters so that when they enter kindergarten, the education gap is narrowed. We did that from 2000 to 2006. The longitudinal study showed that as those youngsters matriculated through the system, the gap narrowed. What happened after 2006? MCPS eliminated those programs and took that money and put it into probably administration. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Sheena Kahende. Sheena Kahende is not here. Our next speaker, Tom Precht. Hi there. Um, my name is Tom Precht. I'm a flower farmer in the Ag Reserve and in Poolsville. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for your service as the County Council. My wife, uh, Sarah, was a uh, county attorney, a Montgomery County attorney for 20 plus years. And uh, I saw the sacrifices that she had to make to be a public servant. <laughs> um, she fought for abuse children she fought to you know prosecute gross misconduct by police officers um, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that she did but I also know how much of a toll it takes to be a public servant so I just want to say thank you to all of you for doing that um, so my wife and I um, she was a professional I was a professional she was a JD I'm a PhD scientist we were working professional jobs and we got kind of burnt out on it as that happens and so we started flower farming 
which is kind of a strange thing to do, but um, it's having a bit of a renaissance these days in the U.S. for a lot of different reasons. Um, so we moved to Poolsville. We bought a 34-acre property in the Ag Reserve, heart of the Ag Reserve, and um, we've been farming now for about six years. And we're incredibly passionate now about farming, about agriculture. It's in my history. It's in my ancestry. Um, and I am seeing some problems and some things that I think we need to address. So, of course, when I started looking for resources and things to help us, I went to the Office of Ag, and um, I started to learn that the budget is not large. Um, less than 0.1% of the entire operating budget is going to the Office of Ag, and I don't think that's nearly enough, obviously. But rather than just complain, I'm going to give you guys two things that you could do right now to help farmers and help the Ag Reserve, one of which is to expand the funding for the Acre Program. That's the Agricultural Cost Share Reimbursement Program. Right now, uh, a farm can get $15,000 in its lifetime through that program. Lifetime. <laughs> Fifteen grand for its life. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's just not nearly enough. And the, the entire Office of Ag can only spend twenty five k a year on all farms. $25,000, all farms. That's 500-plus farms. It's just not nearly enough. All you'd have to do is 10x that, and you'd make a huge difference right off the bat. Fully fund a grant writer for the Office of Ag. The Office of Grants Management is supposed to be doing that. They do not have an ag writer. They're hiring contract writers. I know how to write grants. I could do that, but we need a dedicated person for the Office of Ag to write grants. That would be an easy thing to do. Um, but I think the main point that I want to make to you guys, I don't pretend that one public statement is going to solve much of anything. It's just going to get you on, I'm going to want to get on your radar. This is the introduction to us. I've already talked to many of you directly, and you guys are all very responsive, and I appreciate that. But I am your ally. I'm your partner. I want to work with you to promote ag in the in the county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Amadamola Williams. Greeting, <clears throat> greeting, council members, um, president and vice president. My name is Amadamola Williams. I'm of I'm in many spaces in my um, organizing career. Um, I'm the currently the only person who is. Um, who is the leader of their uh, tenant association that I just started in Gaithersburg, and um, it will grow eventually. Um, also, I serve as the community organizer for the Montgomery County Racial Equity Network. Also, I'm the board member of Young People for Progress and proud, proud resident of District 3, Gaithersburg. So today, I write to you on behalf of the Moore Network, a coalition committed to policy change for the betterment of the county through the collective efforts of advocates, community members, and nonprofits all working together. The, the growing crisis of, of homelessness, mental health, emotional support in our classrooms calls for immediate and strategic action. We need peer, peer support at Progress Place to directly address the uptick in homelessness funding Funding for three peer support specialists at Progress Place is critical. These specialists are vital for engaging with our homelessness uh, population, many of whom battle uh, mental health uh, issues daily along with disabilities. Also, mobile crisis teams and shelter capacity. There needs to be more additional mobile crisis, mobile crisis teams and an increase in shelter capacity. The, Integration of psychiatrists and the continuation of motel overflow sheltering are essential steps towards improving the living conditions of those without homes. Long-term housing solutions. Housing stability to uh, the key to preventing homelessness is the preservation, per perversion and uh, expansion of affordable housing, implementing rent stabilization and eviction prevention, eviction prevention programs will provide the stability, mainly uh, stability of many uh, county residents um, who are in desperate needs. Funding requests, rent stabilization and eviction prevention uh, programs, increased support for uh, rental assistance, 
which is crucial for um, the betterment of everyday people working in Montgomery County, and educational support. Fully funding the MCPS operating budget, including adding money with, when necessary, especially to maintain funding for restorative justice initiatives, and especially for RJ coaches stipends. It needs to it it needs to be increased. It was. Oh. Thank you for Thank your you. testimony. Appreciate it. Our final in-person speaker, Gabriel Nagatu. Good evening. Good evening, council members. My name is Gabriel Nagatu. I'm a long-term resident of uh, Montgomery County. Professionally, I'm a retired banker, but I appear before you this evening as a concerned activist advocating for just and human-centered resource allocation. Recent data on the social well-being of our county is alarming. Among the mix of residents that live in the county, there was a whopping 54% increase in homelessness from 2022 to 23. There is also a rise in the number of people experiencing homelessness, mental health, illness, and food insecurity. It is therefore imperative to find both short and long term solutions with programs that work. My priority for this budget is to find three peer support specialists, and thanks for the same uh, recommendation, at Progress Place to help address the increase in people seeking food, shelter, and other services. This program would help meet residents where they are while they're experiencing co-occurring conditions such as disabilities and mental health illnesses. It provisions for life-saving interventions from professionals who understand the extreme hardship that such residents face. I'm also fully supporting full funding of two or more additional mobile crisis teams, increasing shelter capacity and bringing more psychiatrists to the shelters. These are essential interventions that significantly impact the lives of people experiencing mental health crisis and homelessness. It is vitally important to me that we continue funding them with the end goal of collectively confronting the mental health pandemic with both compassion and resources. I have witnessed firsthand the debilitating effect of mental health crisis, particularly amongst the youth. It is a crisis intensified by the lack of timely and affordable intervention. Funding additional mobile crisis teams would be a first step towards early and preventive intervention. I respectfully request the Council to act on these needs, both as a moral imperative in favor of the least amongst us, but also to execute optimal budget resource utilization. This budget process today is your occasion to bend the arc of history towards care and compassion. And I invite the Council to rise to this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. We're going to move to virtual testimony. First up is Adam Finkelstein. Thank you very much and uh, good evening. My name is Adam Pinkelstein. I'm a member of the Commission on Health and I'm here to speak on its behalf. Uh, the Commission has submitted to the Council three recommendations for funding in 2025 and I'm here to ask that you consider them favorably in this process. First, we've asked that funds be made available to educate county residents on the dangers of excess heat and poor air quality. This is a request made necessary by rising global temperatures which contribute to the heightened and more frequent heat waves. Second, we hope that the council will support uh, non will support nonprofits engaged in food distribution by funding through the Office of Food System Resilience the acquisition, installation, and upkeep of additional cold storage units to permit these nonprofits to effectively carry out their mission. In addition to the cold storage units, we ask that the council and we urge the council to fund a formal evaluation by county staff of the choice pantry model used by some of these nonprofits to assess its suitability for broader implementation. 
Finally, as in past years, we uh, urge council members to budget for a consultant and staffer in 25 to develop an evaluation program and make recommendations on what resources will be needed to strengthen DHHS's public health services infrastructure. There is a need to quantitatively and qualitatively evaluate the 120 plus programs and services um, that, that are run through their external contractor performance and technical assistance, all of which will be effective in serving our residents' needs in order to assess whether they should be continued, changed, or discontinued going forward. Uh, these recommendations are contained in letters we've previously submitted, and I'd be glad to provide them uh, again if needed. Thank you again for your consideration, and have a good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, Jennifer Hughes. Jennifer, you need to unmute, please. Still can't hear you. Okay, there we go. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Jennifer Hughes, and I'm representing Montgomery County Partners for Animal Wellbeing. Many of you also know me as the former county OMB director. Some of you also know me as Dr. No, a moniker bestowed on me by County Executive Leggett. Yet I am here today asking you to add $250,000 to the Office of Animal Services budget to fund a longstanding and desperate need for a robust spay neuter program that provides these services to the many families in Montgomery County who cannot afford to provide the basic vet care to their beloved pets. Several times in the past year, the shelter has reached crisis levels in their population. OAS has responded with short-term fixes. As noted in the Maddie's Fund report, a robust spay-neuter program is a critical step in long-term preventative control of shelter populations. From my research, a robust community spay-neuter program can reduce shelter intakes by 20%. For the county shelter, that would mean a savings of half a million dollars annually based on Washington County, Maryland's cost of each of their intakes. In the midterm, the savings would more than offset the cost of the program, which explains why Dr. No is so supportive of spending this money. There is a nonprofit McCaw partner organization called McSNP that has available to it a mobile clinic at a cost of a dollar per year. The 250,000 would fund the necessary operating costs through contract vets. The funds could be provided to McSNIP through a non-competitive grant as was envisioned under the previous OAS director and would cost effectively serve the economically disadvantaged communities throughout the county. I understand that Director Harefield is now on board and you need to provide her with the opportunity to get the lay of the land, but I'm asking you to appropriate these funds in the FY25 budget for this specific purpose and allow her to determine the best way to provide these services to the community. McSNIP has a well thought out proposal that would allow the community program to quickly get off the ground. The executive funded McSNIP in last year's budget, but did not include funding for it in the FY25 budget. I think believing that another nonprofit group would be providing the same service at no cost to the county. While there is another nonprofit that is purchasing a clinic, we understand it will be focusing on rescue groups and animal, rescue group animals and community cats. We support their efforts. However, that program complements rather than replaces McSNIP since they will not be serving disadvantaged communities where the need for low and no cost spay neuter services is so great. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. We appreciate it. Next speaker, Douglas Hill. Hi, my name is Doug Hill, a Montgomery County resident for over 40 years, and I want to thank the council so much for making sure the MoCo Pride family is in the budget for 2025. The services provided by the organizations involved are essential to the MoCo community. As the father of two MCPS alums, I saw the importance of being affirming and an affirming voice in my children's lives. 
Some of their friends' parents weren't able to be affirming to their children for a variety of reasons. I know the barriers can be numerous for families when it comes to understanding and affirming your LGBTQIA plus child, but what really helped me when my oldest child came out as queer and later as transgender, transgender was to ground myself in the values I was raised in. And those values of respect for different differences, for a society that is strengthened by difference, and for ensuring that families can be kept together that guided me and my family and has thrived by and my family has thrived by affirming my LGBTQIA plus child. For those who aren't there yet, the risks are great, both to the child and to the parents. It can result in the children becoming homeless and parents losing their relationship with their child and even in losing their child to suicide. I take that seriously, and we have housed some of my children's friends when their parents abandoned them. The council funding of the MoCo Pride Center as a safe haven for the LGBTQI youth is a giant step forward. Not many dads feel comfortable or have the language for this discussion, but I implore the council and my fellow dads to get involved. The life that you save could be your own child's. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Our next speaker is Victoria Baldassano. Good evening, everyone. I am Victoria Baldassano. I'm director of the part-time faculty union at Montgomery College. In 2007, I uh, formed a grassroots organization of adjunct faculty at the college, and that turned into our union, which we formed in 2010. Since then, I have played various leadership roles in the union, and um, I will celebrate 19 years of teaching English as a part-time professor at Montgomery College in the fall. Tonight, first, I want to thank all of you for um, basically continued support of Montgomery College, its students, its faculty, and its mission. And uh, I want to urge you to fully fund Montgomery College's fiscal year 2025 budget request. As you all know, Montgomery College has a very diverse student population. Most of our students work to cover tuition and their own living costs. Montgomery College gives these students the opportunity for a better life and success through affordable college education and workforce training. Montgomery College continues to expand its ability to reach students to need um, through projects such as the recently opened East County Education Center. Full funding would allow this work to continue. Full funding would also support the hardworking faculty and staff of Montgomery College. Um, including the part-time faculty whom I represent. MC has uh, used to have 900 part-time faculty. Now we have somewhere between 600 and 900. It's hard to give you a count because um, part-time faculty are, are at a disadvantage in the sense that when there's low enrollment, we are the first to lose our courses. And this happened during the COVID pandemic. We are still, um, gradually getting back our enrollment, and but we're still not where we used to be before the pandemic hit. But uh, our part-time faculty teach many of the core courses that students are required to take for graduation. Also, we are the tutors and coaches that students turn to for extra support. However, we earn um, less than our full-time colleagues for teaching the same courses. So my point is, less than full funding would have a disproportionate negative effect on the part-time faculty. Our students deserve high-quality, affordable college education, and our faculty deserve the support we need to do the demanding job of teaching. Thank you so much for listening to my testimony and for your continued support of Montgomery College. Thank you. Our next speaker, Alexander Harris. Okay. Um, my name is Alexander Harris. I'm a junior at Montgomery Blair High School, and every week or so, a fight breaks out of my school. We as students need restorative justice to improve school climate and directly address the underlying causes of conflict. That is why I'm asking the County Council to add funding for MCPS's proposed budget to keep the current level of funding for restorative justice code stipends. Sorry. Fighting isn't exclusive to my school. According to 2019 data from the National Center for Education Statistics, over one-fifth of high school students had been in a fight during the previous year. Often, these students start by feeling isolated and lonely. 
without support, these feel feelings can fester into violence. People who reject it socially are both more likely to be bullied and to be bullied themselves. They vie, sorry, um, they look to bully to vie for control in a life they feel helpless in. But punishing them by isolating them further only ostracizes them and causes them to lash out more. Expulsion often encourages fighting, if anything, and is sometimes celebrated. The best response is restorative justice, specifically restorative justice counselors and counseling. One of the most common misconceptions about restorative justice is that it is just a slap on the wrist, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. In fact, confrontation is one of the major strategies of restorative justice, and through it, instigators can talk to victims, teachers, and even other instigators to help them grow not only as a student, but as a person. With restorative justice, there are fewer returning cases and school culture improves overall. Montgomery County has partially implemented restorative justice, and the effects are already significant. Almost half of black suspensions decreased in re restorative justice focused schools. The effects of restorative justice are staggering, especially if you apply it well. At MCPS, 81% of RJ service calls did not repeat, repeat the violation. At Cole Middle School in California, expulsion decreased by 87%, with 83% of students saying that there were fewer fights. Yet, MCPS is poised to cut funding for restorative justice coaches, steps that helps make these results happen. My name is Alex, a junior at Montgomery Bear High School. Every week or so, a blight fight breaks out in my school, but that doesn't have to be the case. With restorative justice and restorative justice coaches, we can change that. With proper implementation, we can change our school system for the better. Thank you. Thank you. I don't believe Martha Forlenza is on. So we're going to move on to Chris Irwin. Hi, thank you. Good evening, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Chris. I'm a resident of Silver Spring. I teach in Prince George's County and my wife works for the federal government. Together, we have a one-year-old son. The amazing parks, trails, and their facilities and programming is one of the main reasons that we chose to buy our home in Wheaton and make Montgomery County our home. I'm excited for my son to learn, play, and grow in Montgomery County parks. That's why tonight I urge the county council to fully fund the Montgomery County Parks budget. This budget is necessary to maintain the high quality parks and programming that we've come to know and love and will continue to attract and serve our county residents. Funding the parks is an affordable investment in the health and well-being of all each and every one of our residents, our county's long-term economic health and preserving our open spaces. Funding the parks is an affordable investment and it pays dividends. I just want to highlight one amazing park project that's at risk under the proposed budget. Uh, the Wheaton Regional Master Plan came out and it included an action sports park uh, that will replace three underused softball fields. This includes a skate park, bike park, a parkour and extreme fitness zone, and a wheeled play area for young kids. The concept of this action sports park came from the community, including input from youth in middle and high schools across the county. As stated in the master plan, the goal of the action sports park is to provide safe, inclusive, and engaging adventure sports experiences alongside spaces for social connection and environmental improvement. The new facility should serve a diversity of ages, meaning kids, teens, adults, and families, and all ability levels. While my skateboarding days are mostly behind me, I know how important this project will be to our county's youth. I also look forward to visiting the Action Sports Park with my family and sometime soon seeing my son and his friends enjoy this amazing facility. As mentioned earlier this evening, every county resident benefits from our parks, which is why it's necessary that we fully fund the park budget, not only to maintain the quality of our parks, but also to adapt our parks and our programming to meet the current needs of our community. Lastly, I wanted to thank uh, all the youth and all the teachers who came out to speak tonight. I really support them in their uh, advocacy efforts. I recently learned that over 200,000 county residents live within two miles of Wheaton Regional Park. As a regional park, it is a destination for all county residents, which is why it has some really amazing amenities. There's also a really loved and well-used local park. So I really encourage you to get out there, see it, take a look at the master plan and fund the park's budget. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Our final virtual speaker, Carl Smith. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good evening, council members. My name is Carl Smith. I'm a professor of history and political science at Montgomery College. 
And I'm here today as a representative of the Montgomery College chapter of the American Association of Uni University Professors. I came to Montgomery College in 2004 for the work and the career opportunity. But I have stayed for the remarkable students and chance to be a part of an institution that shapes lives and is an essential part of the community. In my 20 years of service, I still must take a moment now and then to wonder at all the successes I have seen. For example, a former student who is studying medicine at Cornell, a former student from Brazil who completed her coursework at MC and transferred to Trinity to study international relations. The three students from the Renaissance Scholars Program who transferred to Smith on a full scholarship, Smith College in Massachusetts, or the student who completed a master's program at Virginia Commonwealth University who is now an investigator at clinical trials at NIH. She and her husband, by the way, bought a house in Bethesda. All of these successes are built on our partnership, the commitment of the students to work and study hard, the dedication of faculty and staff, and the financial support of the county. To be sure, all of us are still in recovery trajectory from the pandemic. However, I see all around me faculty, staff, and students who are committed to academic achievement. In the last two semesters, I've had the good up fortune of becoming the director of the Institute for Race, Justice, and Civic Engagement. Through the Institute, I have been able to see how ample resources transfer stu transform students' lives in ways both large and small. A meal provided by our food pantry. A student who is short on food money needs a little bit of food to get by through the day. Or as many as 70 students who attend an event discussing the history of the Gullah people during Black History Month. It is thrilling to see and support this kind of engagement in the county's youth. With all of these activities and achievements in mind, I want to express my gratitude to the council's prior financial support of Montgomery College and urge the council to continue to support the college in the future and fully fund MC's FY25 operating budget and likewise fund pay raises for AAUP faculty. With full funding, we can continue to be an instrument for achievement, growth, and personal success in Montgomery County. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the residents who came out today, this afternoon and evening. We had nearly 120 speakers for your thoughtful, respectful testimony. We'll be Reconvening tomorrow, we will not be breaking for a solar eclipse, uh, although that was fun uh, to do today. Uh, with that, this public hearing is now closed. We will reconvene tomorrow with an afternoon and an evening public hearing and a full council session. Thank you, colleagues.